The French Revolution, Reform and the Restriction of the Monarchy, 1789 to 1792. The government of Louis had summoned the state, the general, to meet at Versailles. In preparation for this, it had asked the cahiers or lists of grievances. It got over 60,000 of them. From every part of France, the third estate sent up a similar demand. Reform of taxation, that is, with abolition of the privileges of the first and second estates as the first step. A settled constitution with a regular parliament and a no letter decatted and the abolition of all feudal rights and dues. Naturally, this last demand came most strongly from the rural areas. The remark of the men of one district, how happy we should be if the feudal system were destroyed, expressed perfectly the main trend of the peasants' requests. It might have been thought that Louis and Necker would examine these grievances, draw up a program of reforms, and present it to the assembly which was meeting after so long a time. But that was not Louis' way. Instead of placing himself at the head of the reform movement, he immediately made reform more difficult by expecting the three estates to begin by deliberating separately, as they had done in the medieval past. The effect of this will be that reform measures voted on by the estates separately would almost inevitably be defeated by two estates to one, first and second, five, third estate. On the other hand, if all met as one assembly, the fact that the third estate had been allowed as a special new concession by the crown to have twice as many representatives as either of the other orders will mean that reform measures could be carried. It will require only a few of the poorer clergy to support the third estate, and latter will have a clear majority. It was thus essential to the cause of reform that the estates should meet as one and not three assemblies. Louis had seemed to recognize this by granting the third estate double representation, and now, typically, he changed course. Until such a time as the estates should propose agreed schemes for joint sessions, he insisted on separating the meetings. Voted in this way, and irritated by the absence of any positive lead in the Necker's opening speech, the third estate soon lost its carefree loyal enthusiasm. The opposition to the crown was at first led by the Comte de Mirabeau. He was a violent and dissolute but able and fearless nobleman who had been rejected as a representative by his own order. A mad dog I am, he said, when he offered himself for election to the third estate. But elect me, and depotism and privilege will die of my bite. Under Mirabu's guidance, the third estate refused to accept the policy of separation. Instead, it voted to call itself the National Assembly and invited the other estates to join his body. Some of the parish priests had already come over to the third estate and now the majority of the clergy voted to follow suit. Two or three days later, Louis ordered the hall where the National Assembly was meeting to be closed for alterations and the third estate took the worst possible interpretation of the king's action. Immediately, they adjourned to an indoor tennis court nearby and there the solemn, the, they solemnly saw that they would never separate until a constitution was firmly established. This is the tennis court oath. 
called next to a special royal session to hear Louis propose reforms and his decision to retain separate meetings except for certain purposes. The third estate afterwards refused to follow the nobles and clergy in obeying the royal order to retire. Mirabu put it precisely to a nobleman who acted as messenger for the king. Tell your master that nothing but bayonets will drive us from here. If they come, we buzz off quick. He is reported to have added in an undertone to a friend. But they did not come. The vacillating Louis left the third estate undisturbed. Soon, a majority of the clergy and some of the nobles joined them. And on 27th June 1789, the three estates amalgamated officially by the king's command. The joy was universal and there were cries of the revolution is over. This rejoicing, it soon became clear, were premature. Paris Commune and National Guard. Meanwhile, events were moving rapidly elsewhere. The increasing hunger and the Paris mob and the massing of troops by Louis led to a state of uneasiness. Crimes of violence, particularly robbery of farms in the countryside, became frequent. The government could keep no order and the nation became gripped by fear. As a measure of self-defense, the Parisian electors at the end of June set up a committee in the Hotel de Ville and planned a, vo I mean a voluntary militia, later known as the National Guard. From the press, now entirely neglecting the feeble orders of the government, there poured a flood of revolutionary pamphlets and journals. While in open space, such as the gardens of the Palais Royal Young, orators and journalists like Camille Desmoulins, who was soon to start a brilliant political newspaper, fired the mob by their intoxicating eloquence. Then on 11th July came the dismissal of Necker from his post of controller. It seemed that Louis had followed the Queen's advice and rid himself of the only reformer in his court. Storming of the Bastille 14th July, 1789. The result of all this was an uprising of the Paris crowds, urged by the Desmoulins and others. Large numbers of citizens rushed to seek weapons, on def I mean to defend themselves, if necessary, against Louis troops who were massing in the suburbs. Mobs raided the gunsmith's shop and surrounded the Hotel de Ville, clamoring for arms. There the committee of electors found itself in a quandary. To prevent mob rule, it hastily completed it, its scheme for a citizen militia, but at the same time it found itself forced to hand out its stock of arms to the crowd. With this, on the morning of 14th July, a mob moved on to the great military depot and hospital. Less invalides where they found and seized some 30,000 muskets. And from Lace invades a group, I mean the, the, the invalides, a group several hundred strong swept to the great fortress prison of Paris and Bestale, who was known to contain large quantities of gunpowder. It is unlikely that the crowd at first intended to storm this hated fortress in which so many victims of Lestres de Cate had been confined. Their idea seemed to have been to demand the handling over of the gunpowder and the dismantling of the fortress's great guns, which could have been used against Paris population. But the threatening demeanor of the mob as they forced their way into the bridge to the inner court caused the governor to order his garrison to open fire. Soon there were nearly 200 killed and wounded among the intruders, who would doubtlessly have been driven out had not some munitions 
French troops seized cannons from Les Invalides and trained them on the main gate of the Bastille's inner citadel. This action proved decisive. The irresolute governor gave to the I mean, the, the irresolute governor gave the order to surrender, and the mob poured into the inner fortress. There they found a grand total of seven prisoners, four forgers, two madmen, and a notorious wreck. Typically, of the French Revolution, some of the crowd massacred several of the captive garrison and tore out their hearts and bowels. Later, the governor, too, was murdered, and his head paraded around Paris on a spike. Throughout France and throughout most of Europe, this day's work was hailed as heroic. The Bastille, supreme symbol of French royal despotism, had fallen, and before long, the 14th July will become a great national French holiday. The rebels were now in command of Paris. The committee at the Hotel de Ville became a regular town government or commune with a major, I mean with a mayor in its head, as its head. Sorry. The brave and chivalrous Marquis de Lefavit, who had learned his liberal politics in America, and had been elected vice president to the National Assembly, was installed as commander of the National Guard. Accepting these measures, the mob was soon quieted, and those who were anxious for more disorder were suppressed by Lafayette and the Guard. It remained to secure Louis' approval to accomplish facts. He had little alternative. He reinstated Necker, withdrew his troops from the Paris suburbs, and on 17th July, he came to Paris, escorted by 50 members of the assembly. There he had to recognize the new municipal government of Paris and the National Guard, and to wear in his heart the guards, I mean, Irico cockade. That is the emblem of revolution. Its colors suggested by Lafayette were the old Paris municipal ones of red and blue, with the white of the monarchy between. Risings of this kind were by no means confined to Paris. In the provinces, there was a rush to storm the 40,000 bestiales, that is the feudal castles, and burn the, I mean the, the, the manorial records. Everywhere, towns organized committees of, electoral, of electors into communes and set up self-government on the Parisian model. Soon, there occurred one of the most remarkable happenings in history. It took place on 14th August in the Assembly of Versailles. To dumb down the riots in the provinces, a large group of deputies had secretly resolved to support the peasants' demands and to try to sway the assembly towards this policy. A noble man suddenly rose to purpose and, I mean, the abolition of all feudal rights and dues. Others followed, and the atmosphere became emotional. Noble after noble arose amid scenes of weeping and embracing, to approve the surrender of his own privileges. A frenzy, a frenzy of self-sacrifice set in, and naturally others got sacrificed in the process. And by 8 o'clock next morning, the assembly had passed 30 proposals designed to alter the whole fabric of the French law. Equality of taxation and of legal punishment among the three orders. Admission of all to public office, freedom of worship, abolition of the tithe, the right to be free from feudal dues in return for money payment. These were some of the principles approved by that night and worked out in detail during the following week. The final decree began with the ringing words, the National Assembly destroys the feudal system in its 
it, I mean, it's in its entirety, sorry. No consent to all this. However, had as yet been wrung from the monarch. One result of these changes, when they at length took effect, should not be overlooked. The night of 4th August and its aftermath, it later became clear, gave the peasants almost all they wanted from the revolution. As time went on and extremism and violence grew, the peasants turned naturally to the leader who would guarantee their new won rights. They were now, I mean they were not Democrats, and they happily accepted Napoleon later because he seemed to make secure for them their chief gains from the revolution. The assembly next concentrated on approving a suitable preface to the constitution it was devising to replace the royal depotism. Lafayette was mainly responsible for the drawing up of this preface, which was called the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. It was in vain that a realist, I mean a realist like Mirabu argued that in such a time of anarchy, people needed to be reminded not of their rights but of their duties. Many of the members of the assembly in the idealistic and inexperienced way imagined that the mere statement of the principle guiding the revolution would be almost sufficient to free mankind from its whole load of past oppression. At all events, the document that was produced seemed designed not for the France of 1789 alone, but for all time and of all people. Men were by nature equal. The people were sovereign and must share in the making of the law, which was the expression of the general will. Liberty of person and speech were sacred rights. Rebellion against injustice, a holy duty. A statement of democratic principles so complete naturally led to the great expectations, which in nature of the facts at the time was, I mean, it was simply impossible to fulfill. As one person remarked, it was not wise to lead men up to the top of the mountain and show them a promised land which was afterwards to be refused them. Also, as became clearer later, the frames of the declaration were interested only in political, not economical, equality. Property was another one of their sacred rights. Nevertheless, their document in effect sounded the death knell of the old regime in Europe. It was not long before the Paris mob took a hand again. Philip was already becoming inflamed against Louis, I mean because he refused to accept the declaration and the nobles and clergy's sacrifice of the 4th August. And when the assembly showed itself willing to allow him power to hold up proposed laws for six years, indignation mounted higher still. On top of this, there was ever-increasing famine and unemployment. And then the news that the king had called the Royal Flanders Regiment to Versailles. There, the officers were greeted by their colleagues of the royal bodyguard with a banquet, or, I, mean, I mean, at which the, the, the trico was insulted. This brought matters to a head. Who supplied the leadership for the next move is uncertain, but probably it came from an alliance of the extremists in the assembly and the, in the Paris Commune. At all events, the decision was taken. For such an event can hardly have been accidental to say, stage a woman's march to Versailles to press the people's grievances. Women were chosen rather than men because the effect would be greater, and their hunger cries shriller. But in the event, a number of men, some painted in petticoated, swelled the throng. Hearing the march, Thousands of citizens, including many members of the National Guard, gathered outside the Hotel de Vaillet in Paris. 
Eventually, the commune ordered Lafayette to set off after the marchers with several thousand of the National Guard. His task was to prevent disorder and, if possible, bring the king from Versailles to the capital. Meanwhile, at the Versailles, Louis was recalled from his usual pastime of hunting, and he agreed to see a deputable, I mean a deputation of the women. He promised special food supplies for Paris, and later he also decided to meet the renewed request of the assembly, that he should accept the decrees of the 4th August and in declaration of the rights of man. When Lafayette appeared, the harassed king also agreed that the National Guard instead of the Flanders Regiment should be entrusted with the defense of Versailles. While Lafayette was asleep that night, however, some of the mob broke into the palace. They calmed down only when Louis agreed to return with them to Paris. So around noon the next day, the whole royal family, the baker, the baker's wife, and the baker's son, as the song went, set off for Paris escorted by a motley column of the National Guard, disarmed bodyguards, deputies, food wagons, and mob. The journey took nine hours, and then, for two hours more, Louis had to listen to speeches at the Hotel de Ville before he and his family at length reached the royal palace of the Tuileries. And there, they were as good as prisoners. Ten days later, the assembly sorry, decreed that it would follow the king to Paris. The whole episode was thus very important, as on 14th July, mob action had proved decisive. Neither the Paris Commune nor Lafayette was now clear could control the forces they had helped to set in motion. In Paris, both king and assembly will soon be at the mercy of the mob forces. Already, the transactions of the assembly were public, and outside speakers were even permitted to address the deputies. Soon, it will become a mob fashion to attend the debates, to cheer the most revolutionary speakers and boo and hiss and cheer at the rest, even at waylay, I mean to waylay them afterwards. The whole effect will eventually be to make moderate deputies stay away and to leave matters more and more in the hands of the extremists. Soon, the assembly took another decisive step in the progress of the revolution. Desperate for revenue after the abolition of so many taxes, it turned to the vast, sorry, it turned to the vast property of the church. With the strong support of Mirabu, a measure was passed to nationalize church estates and put them up to public auction. To secure funds before the public gold came in, interests bearing bonds known as assignants were issued to creditors of the government and before long these assignants were declared to be a form of general currency. The assembly, in other words, had gone in for paper money. Unfortunately, paper money, while unavoidable in modern life, presents a standing temptation to financially embarrassed governments. They print off far more of it than the nature of its backing, that is whether gold or land warrants. Not surprising, an assignant which started by being worth a hundred francs in 1790, degenerated, particularly after the outbreak of war in 1792 until 1797, it had become worth about a sou, that is a half penny. If the state confiscated the church's land, it obviously had to take on most of the church's financial obligations, including the payment of the clergy. In July 1790, the assembly passed the radical civil constitution of the clergy. 
By this, the state undertook, among other things, responsibility for paying the clergy who were thus turned into the state officials with bishops and parish priests appointed by a form of election. Though the Pope was still recognized as the head of the church, he was allowed no power at all in France by this scheme. Louis, a good Catholic, accepted it only with the utmost reluctant, but when, as he had feared the Pope in April 1791, solemnly condemned the whole measure, his remorse knew no bounds. From this point must be dated two important developments. From then on, the revolution was rejected by most of the church's leaders and by some of the strongly religious re I mean regions in the West. And from then on, Louis was resolved to halt the revolution by seeking aid from abroad. At last, Louis decided to flee to eastern France, where he will be well placed to find loyal French troops and to receive help from his Austrian brother-in-law, the Emperor Leopold. From this area, at the head of an army including foreigners and emigri, that is the French nobles, he could return to dictate terms to the assembly. It was a fatal plan, however, to rely on forces from outside, and it was one from which Mirabeau, who had come to better terms with the court and was doing his best to keep the revolution within reasonable bounds, would certainly have dissuaded him. But Mirabu, elected president of the assembly in January 1791, had died only four months later. With the, with the despair, I mean with the despairing realization that the monarchy was doomed. I carry with me, he is reported to have said, the last rags of the monarchy. Bereft of Mirabu's wise advice, Louis proceeded on his own rash course. At night, Disguised as a villet, he escaped from Paris by coach with Marie Antony and his family. But the escort and post horse arrangements were wrong. News outstripped his slow rate of progress. And at, I mean at Varennes, a little town f a few miles from the frontier, some carts placed across a bridge by revolutionaries ended his hopes. At the Hotel de Ville in Paris, Lafayette, who had taken charge, issued orders for the return of the fugitives. It was a terrible journey for them. Exposed to every form of insult, they were brought back, humiliated by ruffians, who, despite the bodyguard, poked their heads through the coach windows to spit in the queen's face. And appelled by the alternative jeers and stony silence, of the crowds. It is said that during the four-day ordeal, Marie Antony's hair turned completely white. So the blaze of popularity which at first surrounded the good-natured reforming king was finally extinguished. At Varennes, the monarchy had died. All that Paris had to do a year later was to bury it. The result of this disastrous episode was the growth of the Republican movement. Mirabeau was dead, and Lafayette lost his great popularity when in July he ordered the guard to fire on a mob in the Camp de Mars, who were demanding the king's abdication. The leadership of affairs drifted into the hands of the politicians who were, make, I mean, who were making their name by their eloquence in the political club. The most important of, the, of these new and fast-growing societies was the Jacobin Club, so-called because its parent branched, I mean branch met in the disused convent of St. Jacques in Paris. Within two or three years of its formation, it affiliated over 400 branch clubs in the provinces. Its key role can be seen from the fact that the history of the control of the Jacobin Club till 1794 is, in a sense, the history of revolution. Originally, 
including all shades of reforming opinion, it gradually became confined to extremists as this secured approval for their policies. On the question now of limited monarchy or republic, the extremists drove out one group of moderates who formed the Theuliant club devoted to constitution monarchy. At this stage, however, the Jacobins were not yet all so extreme as the members of a much smaller institution, that is the Cordelia club, which was confined to Paris. The Jacobins were mainly middle class. The Cordelias, though their chief strength was in radicals of the professional classes, also included working men. The Cordelia club had from the start been extremely democratic and it now became the main forum of republicanism. The National Assembly in the main upper middle class body had by now become unpopular with the poor in the towns. These lower ranks of society had as yet gained neither the vote nor the higher standard of living. Indeed, the assembly, to keep the poor in their place and to encourage freedom of commerce, had recently passed laws banning trade unions and strikes. Two of the great weapons of the working class advancement in latter times. On top of this, the assembly was becoming weary from its own immense labors. In two years of ceaseless activity, it had swept aside the tradition of separate estates, framed the Declaration of Rights of Man, abolished tithes and feudal rights, extended the task privileges of nobles and the clergy, banished most of the religious orders, and completely reorganized the church. It had also revolutionized local government by discarding the old unit of the royal administration, including historic provinces, Normandy, Brittany, and the rest, and the old royal officials, including the powerful intendants. Instead, it had organized France into 83 new departments. Each of these was divided into six or seven districts, and each district was subdivided into eight or nine cantons. And in every department and district arrangement were made for local elected councils and executive officers. In none of these new divisions, however, did the assembly allow much poverty to the representative of the central government. The idea was to have only a minimum of control from above, and to this end, the assembly left quite large powers to the lowest units in the scale. The, I mean the communes or municipalities, which also had elected councils of officers. All this local reorganization was a great work in itself, and most of it was to survive all changes of government in France until our own times. The new constitution. With all this work behind it, the assembly was now anxious to complex the constitution, secure its acceptance by the king, and then make way for the new body to be elected under the fresh scheme of government. At last, in September 1791, the complete constitution was duly accepted by the helpless Louis, and Paris again celebrated the end of the revolution. Unfortunately, however, the constitution was far from perfect. The new assembly, usually known as the Legislative Assembly, was to be the dominant partner, but on paper at least the king was still to have considerable powers. This was quite unacceptable to, re to, to the republicans, even though the king's wishes could be thwarted by the financial hold of the assembly. As for the vote, this was to be restricted to those who paid a certain sum of taxes, another point which annoyed the extremists. The really vital defect, however, concerned the communes, of which there were some 40,000 varying from village to large towns. These communes were to be almost entirely self-governing. The central government had reserved very little control 
over them. As the ambassador of the United States of America remarked, I mean remarked, of the new constitution. The Almighty himself could not have made it work unless he created a new species of man. Lastly, as though to increase the difficulty of operating the new arrangements, the members of the National or Constituent Assembly declared themselves ineligible for election to the new Legislative Assembly. They had already in 1789 debarred members from serving as ministers of the crown, and they now extended this prohibition to the assembly to come. These measures were carried by a combination of the extremists on both wings, who were anxious to stop the dominance of the moderate com committee to work with a limited monarchy. The effect was to cut off from the conduct of the government, the main body of men who had begun to acquire some experience of it. The French Revolution, War, Terror, and Dictatorship in 1792 to 1795. From the spring of 1792, the course of the revolution was shaped by a new development, war. Many members of, le of the Legislative Assembly were idealists like those of the National Assembly who had earlier passed a motion renouncing all wars of conquest. However, the threatening attitude of the immigrant nobles and the eastern borders under the sparrings of the Count of Ariosts and Louis' brothers combined with the danger of Louis suddenly received help from Austria and Prussia created in France a panic of the kind which breeds war. At the time, a political group in the new assembly later called Girodins, for several of them came from the Girodin district in southwest France, began to want war for reasons of their own. Prominent Jacobins, as the Girondins mostly were at this time, they were by no means the most extreme groups in the Jacobin club. For though they were determined to preserve the gains of the revolution and even to advance to a republic, they were opposed to the ultra-democratic and terror views of the minority in the club further to the left. Under the leadership of Brissot and Verniguard in the assembly, they became strong enough to force Louis in March 1792 to appoint some of their outside associates as ministers. One of the foremost of, the, of this was a former inspector of commerce, Roland, whose talented wife provided a center for the group in her salon. By this time, the Girodins had conceived the idea that war would unite the country behind its true leaders, the Girodins, and at that same time show up Louis' sympathies with the enemy. This will provide the excuse for getting rid of him. The Girodins, however, were not alone in wanting war. The monarchists among Louis' ministers also wanted it, for a very different reason. The military forces of the crown, if victorious, could be used to crush the revolution, or if defeated, could not prevent France's enemies doing so. In April 1792, the Royal Council accordingly decided on war against Austria, and the Assembly agreed with only seven contrary votes. A few weeks later in July, the war became extended to Austria's allies, Prussia and Sardinia, when she formally requested their help. The Assembly's attitude by now was one of war against king's peace with all peoples. This was a challenge against the rulers of the world, and one which they were not slow to accept. For France, the immediate consequences of declaring war against Austria were disastrous. The entirely, I mean the entirely unprepared French armies tried to invade the Austrian Netherlands and retreated almost without fighting. The king then took the opportunity to veto two of the assembly's decrees and to dismiss some of his Girodin ministers, including Roland. 
The result was another mob explosion. I mean, the, the, which may or may not have been stripped up by the Girodins. A crowd supposedly meeting to celebrate the anniversary of the Tenin Court Oath found its way into the assembly where they sang the revolutionary song Ka Ira, and one of them uh, brandished a calf's hat, labeled aristocrats' hats, on the end of a spike. From there, the mob invaded the Tullias and forced Louis to fraternize with them. Drink their health and wear the red cap of liberty. He stood out, however, against their more serious demands. Shortly afterwards, Lafayette, who was now commanding one of the French armies and who feared that the revolution would be carried beyond the settlement of 1791, made a last effort to save the monarchy. He offered to lead the National Guard against the Jacobians and the other extremist clubs, but he came up against the invincibly folly of Marie Antony. Distrusting Lafayette as a former leader of the revolution, she declared that she would sooner perish than be saved by M. Lafayette, and actually had the Jacobians warned of Lafayette's intentions. She seems to have hoped that by sowing discord among the revolutionaries, she will make the task of her foreign helpers easier. Movement to depose Louis. As the suspicion grew, that Louis had betrayed to enemy the army's plans for the recent campaign. The movement to depose him developed space. I mean apart. Orators on the left repeatedly pointed out the dangers of a stab in the back and at the Condolia Club, the Lord Danton, a patriot and democrat of extreme violence despite some good nurtured qualities began to argue and prepare the next great move in the revolution. Rightly, the Girodin group began to fear that the revolutionary leadership was slipping from their own into other hands, the hands of these who relied on the support of the voteless poor. Republicans, though they were, the Girodins, according offered to save the throne if Louis would recall Roland and others to the ministry. Louis did not accept the bargain, but responded sufficiently to make the Girodins uncertain of their better course of action, whether to save the monarchy or destroy it. Brunswick's Manifesto in July 1792. The impending blow from the left fell in August 1792. By this time, France was aflame with anger as a manifesto issued by the Austro-Prussian commander, the Duke of Brunswick. This manifesto was inspired by the French and Austrian courts. The Brunswick himself, though it, I mean, thought it unwise. If threatened drastic punishment to Paris, if the citizen dared to make any further move against the royal family, and proclaimed that all resistance to Brunswick will be treated as rebellion. From this point on, the disposition of Louis was loudly demanded in Paris by the clubs and by contingents of National Guard called in from the provinces. One such contingent from Marseille had come marching in singing and starring new patriotic song of the French army and the Rhine, recently composed of Strasbourg by Captain Roget Dale Easley. The Marseillais, as it was soon called, swept through France to become the prime song of the revolution and later the French national anthem. It was probably Danton, president to the Condelias and a member of the commune, who now took the initiative. At a given signal, the bell of the Condolias, the forces controlled by the clubs in the various sections of Paris converged on the Hotel de Ville. There they seized power, replacing the moderate rulers of the commune by men of the extreme left. 
This included Hubbard, a violent Condelia who, whose followers became known as the enraged. Then came an attack on the Tolias, led by Cordelia's forces and the men from Masaile. Firing be began, and though Louis' Swiss guard resisted valiantly, they were ordered to retire at the wrong moment and their lives were spent in vain. Meanwhile, as the attack threatened, Louis and his family were persuaded to seek refuge in the assembly, which, however, now proved powerless before the forces of the new leaders of the commune. Like it or not, the assembly had to suspend Louis from his royal functions and confine him and his family in the temple prison. Lafayette, who left his troops and came to the assembly to protest, was promptly declared a traitor and had to flee abroad. At the time, the provincial lawyer, Rosper Berry, an ardent disciple of Rousseau and Jacobin of the left, led a movement to dissolve the assembly and elected a convention on a complete democratic basis. Its task would be to draw a new and more democratic institution in which the king would have no place. This was agreed. Meanwhile, Danton became minister of justice and his revolution was on its way to success and a republic. It had, however, set a fatal revolution. I mean, was on its way to succeed a republic. It had, however, a fatal precedence. In the attack... On the Toilia, some hundreds perished, and subsequently about 800 royalists, sympathizers, and Swiss guards had to be massacred. Thenceforward, the story was largely of one group of revolutionaries repressing another and disposing of them by the process of wholesale butchery. The suspension of the king was the first step in the reorganization of the defenses. France was actually in a dangerous state. In broken out, prompted by Catholic aura or by the measures against the church, now on the 19th of August 1792, the Prussian, whose grievances included the confiscation of lands of German nobles in Asleis, crossed the frontier and quickly captured Longwy. On 2nd September, they followed this by taking Vendun. Panic and anger gripped the country and led to further extreme measures against royalists. In Paris, on the night of 2nd September, March, a doctor and a leading Condelia who ran a violent democratic paper was among those organized. I mean, organized a massacre of the priests and royalists who were being held in prison. The proclaimed intention was to empty the prisons before their inmates could help the invaders. Imtrom two tribunals visited each prison and turned out those they fought guiltily, about of those examined to be butchered by killers waiting in the courtyards. All told about 1,400, two thirds of whom were ordinary criminals, perished in the course of the five days. At least one aristocrat was sliced into shreds, and the Princess de Lembale was appalling mutilated. One man was later accused of roasting and eating her heart. I say these deeds in Paris were not enough. Marat and others at the commune sent a circular in the provinces arguing other cities to adopt this method so essential to the safety of the nation. All this foreshadowed in a horrible, the latter reign of terror. Suddenly, however, the course of the war altered. On 2nd, I mean, sorry, on 20th September, the day before the new democratic elected convention first met, the French repulsed the Prussians at Valmy. It was a mere cannonade, and the Prussians' retirement was rather due to more suspicions of Austrian and Russian's intentions and to Danton's bribery than to French reorganization. But it made all the difference to the spirit of the French. 
the invasion was checked. The, revolu the revolution might be saved. Uh, here and now, say the great German poet Goethe, who witnessed the action, begins a new, as new, a, a new era in the history of the world. The next day, the convention deposed Louis and declared France a republic. Within a few weeks, the French proceeded to advance to the Rhine and to the Austrian dominions in Italy. In November 1792, the convention intoxicatedly voted that France would give her help to all people desiring to recover their liberty and so hurled a further challenge at the world. The trial of the king before the convention soon followed, and charges of treason to the nation. He had no chance of acquittal, although technically by 1791, constitution, uh, his ministers should have been responsible for all his actions. But as Robespierre said, you are no judges, you are statesmen, and the king was unanimously declared guilty. When it came to the question of the punishment, the Girodins and Danton, who really wished to save him, hesitated to lay themselves open to a charge of royalism. And Robespierre's policy of execution narrowly triumphed. On 2nd January 1793, Louis met his death courageously by the new humane method of execution, the guillotine. The execution of the king resulted uh, for France in further terror, dictatorship, and war with most of Europe. Within a few days, the revolution government declared war on Britain and Holland, and within another month, on Spain as well. All these powers had objected to the doctrines of the revolution and the execution of the king, and all were keen keenly co uh, conscious of the danger to the security arising from the French advances, particularly the occupation of Austrian Netherlands and the opening of the lower jetted and violation of past treaties. France's difficulties. Very quickly, the French armies again began to suffer reverses. In the Austrian Netherlands, the French commander, Dumouriez, was defeated and soon afterwards deserted to the enemy. Meanwhile, in the Vindee and Brittany, a second and great rebellion arose, prompted by this time not only by religious feelings but also by opposition to conspiration. All this discredited the Girodins who had clamored most loudly for the war and who were worked closely to the Dumouriez, it also led to the dictatorship measures, such as the setting up of revolutionary tribunals to deal with the offenses against the states <clears throat> and a community of public safety. The function of the latter, which was elected from the convention for a month at a time, was to supervise the rather weak executive council of ministers. To control this temporary but powerful committee of public safety soon became the main object of the various political factions. A similar committee formed soon afterwards, the Committee of General Security had special responsibilities for police and internal security and acted as the main feeder of the Revolution Tribunal. Girodin's Extreme Jacobins. The stage was now set for a struggle between the discredited Girodin's and the opponents further to the left, the more democratic Jacobin's now in control of the Paris Jacobin Club, seeking victory. The Girodin's had the Jacobin president at this time, Marat, who was also member of the convention, howled before the revolution tribunal acquitted he and his colleagues of the mountain, the most extreme section of the convention so-called from their raised seats, soon helped to turn the tables on the Girodins by organizing a public demand for the arrest of the Girodin leaders. To do this, they worked hand in glove with the steel measures which were not merely democratic but socialists, such as control of princes, 
in the interest of the poor. Arrest of the Girodins in June 1793. With the support of the Paris Saint Coulossets, the, the Jacobins were able to have the Girodins leader arrested June, in June 1793. A few months later, they were guillotined in a batch. The perpetual fatal fate of liberals who start revolutions. Roland, who had escaped, wandered, hunted, and miserable till he heard of his wife's execution and then committed suicide. His wife at least left behind her a true and memorable phrase. Gazing at the Statue of Liberty erected near the guillotine awaiting her, she exclaimed, Ah, liberty, what crimes are committed in thy name? Meanwhile, a further rebellion had broke out in the Girodin support, only to be quickly defeated. Its most lasting effect was that it spurred one Norman Gal, Chaloti Koday, into a memorable act. Burning with hatred of the brutal and irreligious policy of the new leaders, she sought an interview with Marat. Admitted to him as he sat on the enclosed steam bath, which gave him relief from a painful skin disease, she killed him with one thrust of a knife. This was a dose of his own stringent medicine. He had once said, 270,000 heads to cut off, and mankind will be happy. 270 heads was the estimate number of the first and second estates. Shortly before this, the convention had approved a new constitution. Extremely democratic, this guaranteed the right to vote to all the adult males and provided for play this besides and on important questions. But it was kept in abeyance while the war crisis continued and was never introduced. Government remained chiefly in the hands of the Committee of Public Safety, whose decisions the convention or those still attending it, for hundreds of the members now began to stay away, rubber stamped for fear of the consequences of acting otherwise. Within three years, the convention sanctioned 11,250 decrees without giving so much as one of them a second reading. All over the country, the Committee of Public Safety was now using the local Jacobin societies to enforce its policy, which included conscription. This had been voted earlier over a wide age range, but never rigorous, rigorously applied. Now it was applied without exemption to men aged 18 and 25, and it produced armies far bigger than was customary. Cannot a committee member who was a former officer was the leading figure in the task of raising armies and training these conscript armies. He accomplished it brilliantly, so well in fact that he later escaped execution because he was regarded as in Napoleon's phrase, the organizer of victory. To enforce conscription and suppress opposition of all kinds, the committee used not merely local agents but also their own members sent down to the provinces as a representative on missions. They made resistance with extreme ruthlessness, and blood flowed freely, not only in Paris, but in many of the great provincial towns. What France now had then was a committee dictatorship based on the support of one part of the convention, the mountain. During July 1793, there was a significant change in the more important of the two committees, that of public safety. Danton, not extreme enough to please the mountain, lost his place, and Robespierre and his associates moved in. Honest in money matters, he was nicknamed the incorruptible. No lover of women and believing in his democratic, Rousiette's decree, I mean creed far more sincerely than many of the other revolutionary leaders, Robespierre 
was also vain in fanatical and determined to enforce his own ideas at all costs. Believing that terror was necessary to inspire virtue, i.e. correct behavior according to Robespierre's own principles, he was one of those primarily responsible for what came to be called the reign of terror. Others helped Robespierre in unleashing this, or even surpassed him. They acted either from similar fanaticism or from sheer criminality or from a realization that the choice was now between being a guillotina or a guillotined. In Paris, Froqui Tinville, the ruthless public prosecutor to the Revolutionary Tribune, claimed over 2,500 victims in 16 months, from Marie Antony and the Girodins down to harmless old women like Madame du Barry whose days of glory as the mistress of Louis were long since over. Among the more depraved parts of the Paris population, a dreadful blood last grew, developing into a kind of worship of Madame Guillotine. Huge crowds attended the Red Mass, as indeed they attended public executions anywhere. And it may be that the government was also ordered executions to provide entertainment for the people and distract their minds from the war. Individual executions in Paris, however, paled into insignificance compared with the vengeance taken by the committee's representatives in the provinces where they were armed revolt. At Nantes, for instance, over 4,000 were butchered in four months some by being sent into a boat which was then deliberately sunk. And at Lyons, 2,000 perished in mass executions conducted by volleys of gunfire. France was now virtually a police state in which few could trust their neighbors and all dreaded the knock on the door after dark. But though the royalists were utterly powerless, the revolutionaries themselves were far more united. Many resented the virtual dictator of the, the dictatorship of the two communities, and there was a growing resentment and, and a move by the extremists of the Paris Commune led by Hubbard to push for the revolution in a social direction in interest of the poor. These agitated forces forced Robespierre and the convention to pass a law of the maximum controlling the price of bread and other necessities. As artists, the Hubbard group also set out to destroy Christian worship. The commune ordered the closing of all the parish churches and enthroned a goddess of reason in the Cathedral of Notre Dame. Disapproving of these measures, the fearful lest the revolution slip from this control. Robespierre and the associates then struck. Hubbard and the other leaders of the commune went the way of the Girodins, and in their place Robespierre secured the appointment of men sub, uh, I mean subservient to himself. By now, however, the French armies, conscript and ragged but full of revolutionary fervor, had recovered from their setbacks and were again triumphant. In this situation, the alarmed and alarmed also at the continued threat of personal liberty. Danton, the Mosulicins and others began to feel the need for peace abroad and reconciliation at home. The terror, they argued, had worked its purpose and should be ended. Sickening of the bloodshed and happy in the love of a young girl he had just married, Danton led a campaign to halt the whole ghastly business. The move was fatal, denouncing him as too indulgent. Robespierre immediately accused him of counter-revolution sentiments, and Danton, 
and demolitionists met the faith they had helped to met out so to so many others. Danton behaved with his invariably courage. As he passed Robespierre's house on the way to the guillotine, he shouted, Infamous Robespierre, you will soon follow me. And on the scaffold itself he made one of the most famous remarks in history. Show my head to the people. It is worth the trouble. Having struck down the Habatists on his left and the Dandonists on his right, there was little to restrain Robespierre. He established the worship of the supreme being, his own particular form of religion, and stepped up the terror. By one ruthless law, known as the law of the 22nd Prairial, suspects were deprived of the help of counsel and could be condemned to the one possible punishment death on the reputation of a bad moral color character alone, which might be made by means of anything. After this, in 50 days, nearly 1,500 held fell. But opposition grew. Too many leaders, far less honest men than Robespierre, began to fear that their turn would come next. They ganged up together, and the momentary alliance cost Robespierre his hold in the Committee of Public Safety and his control of the Jacobin clubs. Shouted down in the convention, he was lodged with his closest followers in prison only to be released by his creatures in the commune. But his opponents in the convention persisted and he was recaptured in Paris Hotel de Villa in 19, I mean in 9th, the middle, 27th July. As he was about to sign an illegal appeal to the troops. The next day, he and 21 of his associates were led to the scaffold and in turn, and the day afterwards, the knife fell on 71 of his supporters in the commune. Strangely enough, though those who overthrew Robespierre were far worse than he, the execution of Robespierreists led to the end of the terror. The country now was so obvious tired of fear and bloodshed that they, new rulers after ensuring their own safety were ex by executing the chief remaining terrorists. Eventually, destroyed the war dictatorship organization which had made the terror possible. They weakened the powers of the revolutionary tribunal, that is, the communities, the committees of public safety and general security abolished the Paris Commune, closed the Jacobins Club, and repealed the law of 22nd, that is, Prairial. Finally, the convention voted yet another new constitution in which the electorate would be restricted to taxpayers. A reaction against extreme democracy and power split between a two-house assembly and a directory of five men aided by the long drawn out war and by public feeling against Britain's attempt to promote a further rising in La Vendée and a landing in Brittany, the men who had ousted Robespierre kept their hold on affairs and one of their leaders, Barras, later secured appointment to the directory. When there was a royal rising in Paris shortly before the new constitution came into force, they ordered out the troops and a whiff of grape shot dispersed the mob. The officer in command was a sallow skinned Kors I mean Corsican named Napoleon Bonaparte, who from being a directory's savior of the servant was soon to prove its master. How are we to explain this almost incredible French Revolution and its outstanding mixture of idealism and villainy, courage and cowardice, reform and tyranny? Origins of the Revolution's Violence Chiefly, by bearing in mind this fact that France, a country undergoing a radical reshaping of her organs of government at the critical moment was plunged into war, 
both national and civil war. With the fear of it generates often produces reckless violence against opponents at home. And so it was the French Revolution, further the democratic creed of the French Revolution based on the idealism rather than the practicality ability at the time encouraged the belief that the mob is always right and robbed leader after leader of the will or courage to hold the mob when it was obviously wrong. But the system of open debates in assembly, convention, clubs, and local communities, those who act moderation were always liable to be shouted down and accused of the unforgivable offense of counter-revolutionary sentiments. Worst of all, perhaps, was the permission given in July 1792 to the local assemblies of the 48 Paris sections, that is the electorate districts, to consider themselves in permanent session. This meant that the fanatics could always outstay the wearied moderates and reverse any decision they disliked. At critical moments, too, the undue importance of the municipal government of Paris or commune, which was eagerly captured by the extreme left, had a disastrous effect on the more moderate convention. Thus, partly because of the war, internal and external, partly because of the genuine difficulty of keeping a hold on a country freed from the shackles of centuries, partly because of the unrealistic theories of the revolutionary and the practice of open debating, partly because of the independence of the commune and the sections, the conduct of a Affairs rapidly drifted into the hands of extremists, and the revolution developed from a movement of peaceful reform into, I mean, a wealth of terrorism and bloodshed. Yet it must never be forgotten that when the frenzy of violence died, the permanent benefits of reform remained. This did not include democracy, for France had shown herself as yet incapable of it. They did, however, include equality before the law, administrative reform, fairer taxation, liberate industry and commerce, and the foundation of schools, colleges, museums, libraries, and the metric system. Together with all this went the abolition of feudalism, the distribution of feudal land among the peasantry, and the transference of the major share in the state from nobles and clergy to the Bogists. It was the greatest achievement of Bonaparte not to destroy the revolution, but while maintaining law and order to preserve most of these essentials. The Revolutionary Wars and the Rise of Napoleon Bonaparte from the first coalition to the Treaty of Amiens, 1793 to 1802. We must now follow the career of the fascinating and repellent genius who in almost equal measure restored in the ruined France. We have seen how for a number of reasons, including the threat of the doctrines and the occupation of the Austrian Netherlands, the war which revolutionary France had declared against Austria in 1792 had by 1793 developed into a war against a European coalition. The prince of France's initial failure in this was the terror and dictatorship. The dictatorship directed mainly by the Committee of Public Safety succeeded in redeeming the military situation. By 1795, the work of Cannot and others on the Committee Cannot just not only planned campaigns and organized armies but also turned up in civilian dress to lead the advance of Fleurus in 1794, which captured the Austrian Netherlands and the enthusiasm and of the rugged French troops had driven Prussia and Spain from the war. Holland, too, had not only failed on land and lost a fleet captured by a cavalry charge across the ice, but had also been compelled to make a peace which put her forces at the disposal of France. The Prince of Orange fled. 
the Republican Party collaborated with the French and Holland found herself reshaped along French lines into the, I mean, Batavian Republic. Of the first coalition, only Austria, Sardinia, and the main originator and paymaster Britain still remained active by the autumn of 1795. Britain's record in the war thus far had been inspiring in Europe, though she had picked up some territory overseas. Her efforts, including the capture of Toulon with the Spanish in 1793 and its loss four months later, an unsuccessful expedition to aid a revolt in Brittany, defeat under the Duke of York in the Netherlands, and an incomplete Lord Howe victory, as Nelson termed it. Outside Brest on an, an incomplete Lord Howe, that is the glorious 1st of June 1794, when Howe's fleet, which had been uh, uh, blo blockading Brest, I mean, captured six warships, but allowed a big gain convoy from America to get through to the French port. The strategy of the Francis new government, the, the I mean directory installed in November 1795, was to knock out Austria before concentrating on Britain. It was a good moment to deal with Austria, not only because she had lost most of her allies, but also because she was busy absorbing a further slice of Poland. That is the last stretches of uh, which had been finally partitioned between Austria, Prussia, and Russia on October 1795. In the ensuing campaigns, the French conscripted, uh, I mean conscript, still managed to maintain uh, it one, one of the secrets of his success, an astonishing degree of faith in liberty and equality, but the actual government of France, the directory which moved very far from the crusading spirit of 1792. Instead, it approached the war in the Louis tradition of foreign conquest and glory, to which it added the idea of extending France to her natural frontiers, that is the Rhines, the Alps, the Pienses, and the oceans. Already in October 1795, the Austrian Netherlands has been declared, I mean incorporated in France and other additions were now planned. The directory indeed still offered the new liberty to the peoples of Europe and was soon able to set up more satellite republics like that formed in Holland. But usually the new liberty was to turn out to no more acceptable than the old tyranny. The French planned to attack Austria from more than one direction. Not only were two French armies to attack directly along the Rhine, the new Beirut, but in addition, that army was to enter Italy, capture the Austrian possessions there, and then join the attack on Austria itself via the trail. The soldier appointed by the Napoleon Bonaparte, who had already proved his worth in ousting the British from Toulon in 1793 and the royalists from the streets of Paris in, 19, in 1795. A penniless friendliness, one meal a day young artillery officer in 1789 who had welcomed the revolution as a keen disciple of Ryusiu and had maintained sufficiently close relations with Robespierre to be thrown into prison when he fell. But he had learned the, to despise the mob and to love mob violence in the scenes he witnessed in Paris. And gradually, his sense of order triumphed over the revolutionary principles. Still partly in disgrace, he had been on the spot in the difficult situation in 1795, and his prompt order to fetch cannons and fire on the mob had saved the new directory. 
His rewards were the command of the Italian expedition and the hand of a mistress of the directory Barras, that is Josephine Buhaunius, with whom he was passionately in love and who had useful aristocratic conditions. On 11 March 1796, after a two-day honeymoon, Bonaparte departed for Italy. Within a month, he had pulled his lax, ill-equipped and disorganized troops together and was ready for action. His words to them on the opening of the campaign are famous. You are badly felled and nearly naked. I was going to lead you to the most fertile plains in the world. You will find there great cities and rich provinces. You will find there honor, glory, and wealth. A few days after he entered Italy, he had succeeded in his first object of separating the Austrian and the Sardinian armies. And the king of Sardinia was demanding peace from the general whose troops had practically no artillery, no cavalry, no boots. The rest of the campaign continued on the same lines. By brilliant strategy and matching, he contrived the and maneuvered numerically superior opponents into positions where they could engage only a small portion of their forces against his entire strength. He had too a powerful more weapon and the appeal of the doctrine of liberty to peoples under aristocratic or foreign rule. Within little more than a month after setting foot on Italy's soil, he had forced the bridge of Lodi and entered Milan, the capital of Lombardy and the Austrian headquarters, amid the rejoicing of its Italian population. Here, as in other conquered areas, Italy later, the French set up dependent republic. A check came when, for some months, the enemy held out in Mantua, but finally by the Battle of Rivoli, in early 1797, this resistance was crushed. The Austrians became demoralized and the victorious Bonaparte chased them out of Italy to within 75 miles of Vienna. There, he stopped only because the Austrians signed a truce. Converted some months later into the Savia Treaty of Campo Formio. By this treaty, Austria was compelled to recognize not only France's conquest of the Austrian Netherlands and her newly won Rhine frontier, but also the laws of Lombardy and its incorporation into a new state, the Kisalfin Republic, which, although nominally independent, was entirely under French control. In return, France threw Austria a shameful bribe. Venice, which had no quarrel with France and which had preserved her existence as an independent republic for 1,100 years. The Italians who had helped the French were thus soon to find that liberty was not everywhere applied and that even where it was, it was expensive. From Venice and the Cisalfin Republic, and the papal states which were equally at his mercy, and parts of which were incorporated in the Cisalphine Republic, Bonaparte poured back tribute over the Alps in the form of cash and masterpieces of art. The papacy alone, for instance, had to pay 300 million francs masterpieces of art, that is, compensation for the murder of a French envoy by the Roman people. Thus, within 18 months, Austria had been beaten out of the coalition, that is, North Italy complete, was completely now organized. France enriched and glorified, and the name of Napoleon Bonaparte sent ringing throughout Europe. Britain's critical year, that is 1797, 
while a major sea power occupied the coast of the low countries. Accordingly, 1797 saw a determined French effort to crush her. It was indeed a critical year for Britain with no allies. An imminent revolt in Ireland, mutinies in the fleet, corn shortage, a financial crisis, and control in India threatened by the French inspired Tiopt, I mean Tipo Sahib. But the schemes of the French went astray. In spite of the fact that Holland and Spain had now to act her as allies and move their fleet at her dictation. At the end of 1796, an attempted French invasion of Ireland at Banty Bay had been scattered by storms, and the French efforts of 1798 to carry aid to the revolt of Walfrey Tone and his United Irishmen were little more successful. The grave danger to Britain during these years, in fact, came from France's compulsory allies rather than her own disorganized navies until Jervis and Nelson, that is his second in command, who initiated won the day, defeated the Spanish off Cape St. Vincent and Duncan, disposed of the Dutch and camped down. Britain, for the moment, was safe. The Egyptian campaign of 1798 to 1799. It was left to the conqueror of Italy to devise a more brilliant, if fundamentally impracticable, scheme of attacking their obstinate island. Knowing that Britain was a world power to whom commerce was the lifeblood, Bonaparte planned to capture Egypt which was part of the Ottoman or Turkish Empire. Ruin the British trade in the Mediterranean and possibly even advance overland and seize India. The fascination which the East had exercised over his mind from boyhood urged him on, as well as that valuating ambition which could say my glory is threadbare. This link, little Europe, is too small a field. Great celebrity can be won only in the East. The directory readily approved the proposal. Bonaparte was becoming so powerful that it might be wise to keep him away from France. So, with an army of 38,000, a large group of scientists and antiquarians and 400 boats, and with the whole expedition financed by plunder from the two new French Brussels republics, that is the Helvetic and the Roman, Bonaparte sailed from Toulon for Egypt. Eluding Nelson, he took Malta from the needs of St. John en route, cleverly continued to give Nelson the slip and arrived off Alexandria in July 1798. Before the month was out, he had overwhelmed the famous Turkish cavalry force, that is, the Mamelukes, at the Battle of Pyramids. Forty centuries look down on you, he said to his troops before the battle, and Egypt lay at his, his, his feet. Within a few days, however, Nelson came on the French fleet to anchor in al Bokir Bay and utterly destroyed it. So cutting off French communications with Europe. Without sufficient reinforcements, Bonaparte could not advance to India, and he was thus driven into adopting an alternative plan, almost equally ambitious, of invading Syria, pushing through Asia Minor, capturing Constantinople, and smashing the Ottoman Empire. Syria proved an easy victim he again posed as the deliverer from Turkish rulers. Till he was held up at Acre by Admiral Sir Sidney Smith who swept up the French transports and landed a British naval force to help defend the city. Frustrated, Bonaparte had finally to retire to crush a Turkish attempt 
at recapturing Egypt. At this stage in August 1799, master of Egypt but a prisoner there because of the loss of his fleet, Bonaparte learned some astonishing news from English newspapers thoughtfully sent him by the eccentric Sir Sidney Smith. In Europe, the French were on the run. A second great coalition has been formed, this time between Britain, Turkey, Austria, Russia, Portugal, and Naples. Austria was alarmed at the fresh French aggression in Italy, which had driven the Pope from Rome, set up another republic in Naples, and captured Piedmont, while the new ally Russia joined because her half mad Sir Paul was sentimentally attached to the Order of St. John and resented Bonaparte's move towards the East. This, that Sir considered, should be reserved for Russian and Turkish influence. From Italy, Bonaparte learned the French troops were being expelled by the fierce Cossack General Suvovok. Sorry, Suvov, Suvorov. General Suvorov, while the other French armies were hanging on with difficulty to their conquests on the Rhine in the Netherlands and Switzerland. There were two rumors of royalists' plots and treachery among French generals. The year 1801 thus finished with Britain triumphant in the Mediterranean and the Baltic further afield on the suggestion of the exiled Prince of Orange, she had occupied the Dutch possessions of Ceylon and the Cape of Good Hope, and she had also captured Trinidad from the Spain. France was equally supreme on the European continent. On both sides there were accordingly overtures for peace, and in March 1802 the two enemies signed the Treaty of Amiens. Its most important terms were that Britain was to restore the Cape of to the Dutch and Malta to the needs of St. John while retaining Ceylon and Trinidad, and in return, France was to evacuate Rome and southern Italy and restore Egypt to Turkey. Bonaparte approved the first council for life by an overwhelming place beside Kunao, it seems devoted his genius to the arts of peace. Napoleon Bonaparte's achievement in France as first consul and emperor in 1800 to 1814. As a general, Bonaparte's genius was finally unproductive because he took on too much. As a statesman, however, he gave France institutions which in different forms have endured to this day. Most of the creative works dated, I mean dates from his years as first consul 1800 to 1804, which included uh, a period free from war when he could concentrate on his country's internal problems. His first care was to consolidate his own power. To begin with, he had been appointed first consul for 10 years, but in 1802 he improved on this by becoming first consul for life. In 1804, he then took the logical step for turning the central government, government into an imperial dictatorship. With himself as emperor, Napoleon, he kept representative institutions only in power form, but secured the approval of France by plebiscite. Reorganization of local government in 1800. Napoleon's central government perished with him. However, his earlier reorganization of local government, that is an area which the revolutionaries of 1789 had plunged into near chaos, became the basis of the modern French system. As first consul, he retained the new division of France into, I mean, departments, but created a new subdivision, the arrondissement, to replace the district which he had been abolished by convention. More important under Bonaparte's scheme, the leading official in each division and subdivision was appointed directly or indirectly by the central government. Local councils continued to be created by their powers, but their powers became largely advisory. 
The real business was done by officials. Repre that is who represented the, and owned their positions to the central government. They were the perfect and in the department, the prefect in the department, the sub-prefect in the arrondissement and the mayor of the commune. Bonaparte, in fact, as first council, nominated the prefects and sub-prefects, and the prefects chose the mayors. Thus, control over the provinces lost in 1789 to 1791, and increasingly reasserted by every government since then, by 1800, was permanently recovered. From then on, Frenchmen had a little effective share in governing their own localities, but they got well-chosen officials, good order, and the possibility of a strong and unified national policy. In the realm of education, Bonaparte's government during the consulate made some important advances. It neglected elementary education, leaving this largely to the church, but encouraged secondary education by founding secondary schools, but to, run by, to be run by the communes and lices, or semi-military secondary schools to be run by the government. In this, science and mathematics were secondly only to military training. At Eton at this time, the main subject studied was still Greek and Latin. Later, under the empire, a university too was founded, the University of France, consisting of 17 academies or branches in different districts. The grand master of this university, chosen directly by the emperor, was expected to control virtually the whole educational system of France. None of these new institutions catered for girls. I do not think we need travel ourselves with any plans of instruction for young females, said Napoleon. Public education is not suitable for them because they are never called upon to work in public. Manners are in all to them and marriage is all they look to. And a clever man, as a clever man who had himself risen solely by his abilities, Bonaparte was determined that the great state positions should be open to all men of talent, however humble their origins. He sought such men of his council for his council of state, a purely advisory but important body whose expert knowledge helped him greatly in the various tasks of government. Accordingly, while he allowed the immigrants to return, he no longer permitted them to consider themselves the true nobility of France. Instead, he created a kind of nobility of talent by founding the Legion of Honor. Membership of the Legion came to the cherished distinction, awarded for services in such matters as politics, civil service, local government, and the arts. But in the founder's time, the appointments were nine-tenths military, Men, he said, are led by toys. When he became emperor, he developed uh, this theme, but in many ways contradicted the idea of the Legion of Honor by creating a new hereditary nobility to grace his imperial court. All told, he created some 3,000 new hereditary nobles, including four princes, 30 dukes, and nearly 400 counts quietly apart from the members of his own family to whom he allotted kingdoms. In a religious affair too, Bonaparte for all his irreligious nature left his mark on France. During the revolution, the, uh, Christ, uh, the extremists had uh, sub, I mean, severed the church in France from its head. The Pope, and by so doing, he brought about religious conflict and chaos. Although such revolutionary deities as the goddess of reason and the supreme being he had quickly passed out of fashion, the church in France in 1800 was still disunited and cut off Rome. Nevertheless, the overwhelming majority of French peasants were Catholic at heart, even if the intellectuals were not. Anxious 
to secure his regime by placing the peasants and at the same time ending the religious strife in the west of France, Bonaparte, as first consul, I mean, came to an agreement with the Pope. By the conduct of 1801, Catholicism was recognized as a religion of France's rulers and of majority of Frenchmen, although other religions were not forbidden. Bonaparte, however, was able to drive a hard bargain with Rome. For the Pope feared a French occupation of the papal city. The French state was to choose this, the bishop whom the Pope will install, pay the clergy, and generally control the church, which will be under only the nominal leadership of Rome. Above all, the church lands confiscated at the revolution were not to be returned. This, thus, the peasants were won over to Bonaparte not only because he restored their religions, but because he saw that they kept their recent gains. The concordant did not please everyone. One distinguished general was overheard to remark at the tear, that is, tedum, the reconciliation. The only thing is the million dead men who died to get, however, knew he was in appealing to the old religious instincts. He saw in religion what he called the cement of the social order, something useful in binding men and keeping, something that young words, I mean young ladies, especially to make them meek and obedient wives. In order, or I mean in other words, religion was for Bonaparte only a moment. The depth of his Catholicism may be judged from the way he later annexed the papals had the Pope carried off to France. Nevertheless, the concordant helped to restore social stability to a France who which badly needed it at the time. Industry and commerce. Both as first consul and emperor, Napoleon was actively interested in French industry and commerce. Commercial exchanges and chambers of commerce were created, and advisory boards set up for many manufacturers, arts, and crafts. High protective tariffs sheltered French industries from foreign competition. Technical schools, prizes, loans, and exhibitions encouraged new processes, and France deprived of certain staple articles by the continental system managed to develop efficient substitutes such as chicory for coffee and beer for cane sugar. New cotton machines were invented and factory acts passed. Further, by maintaining a stable currency based on gold and by his creation of the Blanc of France while first Council Napoleon won the support of all the business interests. In fact, by an elaborate series of decrees, Napoleon's government regulated almost the whole of the national life art, the theater, the press, commerce, industry, and religion. This regulation was not all gain. High tariffs meant great hardship for many consumers in the form of increased prices. Government censorship greatly limited freedom of publication and regulation of industry, hindered as well as helped industrial development. Whether the merits of the general financial and commercial policy, there is no doubt that Napoleon's great schemes of public works as emperor permanently beautified and enriched France canals, bridges, and roads were constructed. Marshes drained, seaports enlarged, and fortified museums were founded, and their louvre completed and filled with the priceless treasures stolen from Italy. Palaces like Fountain Blue were restored. The planning of a great group of artificial roads radiating from the Arc de Triomphe and the clearing of the Tourisies Garden gave Paris the beginning of its modern beauty. It is of little wonder that Napoleon was immensely popular 
with the French until 1808. Until in Napoleon was immensely, I mean, other words, his plans grew too vast. He began to test defeat, and he cost France too much in men and money. The Code, Napoleon, 1804. Of all Bonaparte's non warlike achievements, his greatest was perhaps the civil code of the Code Napoleon, a summary of the laws of France on such topics as rights and duties, marriage, divorce, percentage, inheritance, and prosperity, and a statement of the general legal principles concerning them. After the old tango of the Frankish Roman royal, provincial and baronial laws which had been, I mean, complicated rather than unraveled by the revolutionary legislation, the code was crystal clear. It was, of course, not the actual work of Bonaparte. The decision to compile a code had been taken before he came into power, but as First Council, he presided over about half the meetings of the committee which reviewed the lawyer's drafts and had a decisive influence on its development. Often, he was able to secure greater clarity and to place his weights behind clauses which increased the power of the states, the husband or the father, Napoleon's greatest pillars of authority. The Civil Code was not a very progressive document. It allowed few legal rights in women and permitted a father to have his child temporarily imprisoned. However, it confirmed the re legal equality of male citizens, helped to bring social stability, and enabled Frenchmen and others to understand the main principles underlying the laws. In the words of one historian, it was at once the summary and the correction of the French Revolution. Other codes on commerce and criminal law followed, but the civil code was recognized as outstanding and was soon widely adopted by different states in Europe and in South America. Through the code, therefore, Napoleon helped to give one of the main bulwarks of domestic peace, a great legal system, not only to France, but to the world. The Struggle Against Napoleon From the renewal of war to the height of Napoleon's power in 1803 to 1810, the peace of Amiens was always unlikely to give more than a short breathing space. He did not mention a question of the great importance to Britain, the French annexation to the Austrian Netherlands, and it left both sides deeply suspicious and without the real will to peace. France refused to give any greater freedom to British trade. British caricaturists refused to be kinder to the Bonaparte. France, too, was clearly planning to extend her influence in the Near East India and West Indies, but equally clearly, Britain would brook no importance colonial rivalry. In this highly charged atmosphere, the break came over Malta. Britain decided to violate the treaty by holding on to Malta till Bonaparte stopped scheming and to revive his power in Egypt. Bonaparte decided to violate the treaty by holding on to southern Italy till Britain withdrew her forces from Malta. By 1803, the two rivals were at war again. France being helped by Spain after the British seizure of some Spanish treasure ships destined to subsidy for France. The struggle which followed was a more personal one than the earlier bout of war against France. By 1804, when Bonaparte rid himself of his fellow consuls and became the Emperor Napoleon, the flame of the French Revolution was plainly dying down. 
Therefore, Europe had to deal with the ambition of one man rather than the burning zeal of a nation. With the intention of mounting a direct attack on Britain, Napoleon first marshaled an enormous force in camp of Belongu. The channel, he said, is a ditch which it needs, but a little courage to cross. So an army of 100,000 men was held ready for the venture, and some 1,500 flat-bottomed ferry boats constructed. But the scheme depended entirely on the absence of the British fleet, for Napoleon's first idea of slipping across in the calm of dark or foggy night was obviously absurd. Even after Ballon Harbour had been enlarged, five or six tides would be required to embark so great a body of men. Accordingly, he directed his fleets to escape the British blockade, which was normally maintained as near the France naval ports as conditions permitted. Join up the Spanish, lure the British away from the Channel by a faint attack on the West Indies and race back across South German states. With Austria powerless, Napoleon, a few months later, was able to set up a union of West German states known as the Confederation of the Rhine, the princes of which were sworn to carry out his orders in foreign policy. They soon declared their resignation from the old Holy Roman Empire, which Napoleon had declared he would no longer recognize. Francis of Austria thereupon resigned as its head to become Emperor of Austria instead, and the Holy Roman Empire, which had endured in a name at least for a thousand years, came to an end. The town of Prussia came next. Prussia had not joined the, I mean the coalition as at its onset. For Napoleon had bribed her by allowing her to occupy the ancestral territory of Britain's George III, Hanover. He then thought better of this and proposed to hand back Hanover to George III as part of a bargain with Britain. This and another action stung Prussia to the point of belatedly declaring war in which she put pressure on Saxony to join her. Only five days later, the battlefield of Jena in Thuringia witnessed the most crushing defeat ever inflicted on Prussian arms. The Prussian military machine fell to pieces and Napoleon entered Berlin. From Berlin, Napoleon's next move cast to deal with Russia, which still remained active against him. In doing this, he could count on the help of the Poles, to whom, as to many other people, at first he appeared as the liberator. He encountered the main Russian army in Friedland in East Prussia and beat them and the Prussians so severely that Alexander decided to reverse his whole policy and make peace. The Treaty of Tilsit, first broached by the two emperors on a raft on the river Niemen, proved to be almost the height of Napoleon's power. By its terms, Alexander recognized Napoleon's arrangement on the continent, including the Confederation of the Rhine and the setting up of a new Grand Duchy of Warsaw. In return, Alexander received the promise of a free hand in Eastern Europe and a share in the Turkish Empire when it was to be annexed. More important still, he agreed if Britain should refuse to give up her colonial request to her right of such to join Napoleon's continent system. At the same time, Russia made similar promises. The continental system was the basis of Napoleon's strategy from this point. After Trafagla, Napoleon had come to realize that Britain could not be conquered by sea. 
and he therefore sought to use against her not a military or naval, but an economic weapon. In other words, to strike a death blow to her trade and wealth. It was a policy which the earlier revolutionary governments had initiated, but which he was to systemize. For this purpose, he issued from Berlin 1896, after the Battle of Jena and Lata from Milan, a series of orders known as the Berlin and the Battle of Jena and Lata from Milan, a series of orders known as the Berlin-Milan Decrees. The effect of which was to forbid France or any of her allies or subject territory to accept British goods, which were to be confiscated whenever found. British ships were to be excluded from all ports and by thus counting off Britain's means of export, while still allowing her to import certain French goods, i.e. allowing Britain to buy but not to sell. Napoleon hoped to rob Britain of her gold reserve, start a financial crisis and bring his enemy to bankruptcy. It followed that if the scheme were to be successful, it will have to be applied practically all over Europe. Hence, his effort to make it really a continental system. And if the whole of Europe had to be controlled in order to beat Britain, Napoleon was certainly beginning to bite off rather more than he might be able to chew. Yet, his capacity for chewing seemed unlimited. By 1807, he had crowned himself king of Italy in the old Austrian dominion in the north, made his brother Joseph king of Naples in the south, made another brother Louis king of Holland, and a third Jerome king of Westphalia, formed from the west lands of Prussia, while from eastern Prussia territory he had formed the Grand Duchy of Warsaw. Master of the continent and secure in the new Russian alliance, he hoped that the occlusion of Britain goods will soon settle his last outstanding problem. Britain's retaliation was swift and effective. By a series of orders in Council of 1807 and later, all countries which accepted Napoleon's orders were declared to be in a state of blockade, and any port excluding British vessels were to be deprived of the opportunity of welcoming those of other nations. Britain thus aimed at starving the continent of alternative sources of supply, causing a rising prices and hardship in each country, and therefore discontent against Napoleon, who had started the whole business. The absence of any French navy worth mentioning made the British blockade practicable, and when the British government heard that Napoleon was planning to seize the Danish navy, it took prompt, if lawless, action, ordered the Danes to hand over their fleet to British keeping till the end of the war, and on their refusal bombarded Copenhagen till the vessels were duly surrendered. The last considerable danger being thus removed, Britain could carry out her orders in council effectively, and the grim trade war began to strip for the commerce of Europe. The first country to revolt against the system was Portugal, which had long carried on a very profitable trade with Britain. Napoleon used the occasion typically collecting five French armies on Spanish soil for the advance of Portugal then, when this was conquered, bullying the Spanish royal family into resigning their throne to his brother Joseph. But the move was fatal. Doctrines of liberty made no impression on the extremely backward and intensely Catholic Spaniards. Encouraged by the priests, they firmly resolved not to accept the rule of the man who by 1809 had caused the Pope to be kidnapped and the Papal States to be incorporated in France. Moreover, the hostility of the peninsula to Napoleon supplied Britain with a place for the operation of her army, a highly important development. With the Spanish victory at Bailen and the British and Portuguese victory at Vimiero in 1808, 
fortune began to desert the French in the peninsula. For the moment, Napoleon restored matters by coming from Central Europe to take charge himself. But under Sir John Moore, the remaining British army in Portugal another had withdrawn by a mutual arrangement with the French known as the Convention in Sintra staged a desperate hit and a run attack into Spain. It ended in a hurried embarkation of Coruna, but prevented the emperor from overrunning Portugal. Torres Vedras As soon as Napoleon was gone from the peninsula, the tide turned again. The British under Wellesley, the future Duke of Wellington, landed against in Portugal and advanced successfully into Spain, where he defeated King Joseph of Clavera, for this he was made Vancouver Wellington. Driven back by French reinforcements, Wellington retired to Lisbon area. Around here, as Torres Vedras, after devastating the country in front to rob it of supplies and cover, he constructed an elaborate series of defensive artworks so strong that even Marshal Ney, the bravest of the brave, refused to attack them. From these defenses, Wellington could emerge and support the, I mean, the peasantry in the ceaseless guerrilla warfare against French. A warfare so intense and so savagely cruel on both sides that prisoners who were merely shot or blinded threw themselves lucky, thought themselves lucky. On one captured French general was thrown into a vat of scalding water. Like previous invaders, the French had the eternal difficulty of fighting in mountains, country, or I mean mountainous country where communications were almost non-existent. Where a small army is beaten and a large army starves. Nowhere else had they operated in the barren country and amid a fanatically hostile population. French commanders in different parts of Spain learned of each other's movements only from Napoleon in Austria, who often depended on the English newspapers for his information. A force of 200 cavalrymen was necessary to get a message from one village to another as a smaller number will be murdered by peasants. Slowly, Wellington grew stronger and prepared to advance. The first cracks were appearing in Napoleon's great edifice. Elsewhere, the system as yet remained intact. In 1809, Britain sent an expedition to Walcheren of the Mount of shed it to free Holland, but it did not even succeed in fighting, let alone winning a battle. Lingering under inefficient commanders, it felt a victim to the swamps and fevers of the island and perished miserably. Austria too tempted to try conclusions once more by French failures in Spain, found Napoleon still far too strong as the Battle of Wagram lost even more territory and had to promise to enforce the continental system. Moreover, she was made to ally with Napoleon and supply him with a new life. The prince, I mean the princess Marie Louis, for Josephine had not provided the emperor with an heir and was now conveniently divorced. So, by 1810, with opposition against crushed in Europe, with Sweden compelled to adhere to the continental system and Holland now completely incorporated in the French Empire following Louis Bonaparte's unwillingness to apply the system rigorously, Napoleon might hope that his mastery of Europe was secure and that his last remaining problems, Britain and Peninsula, will soon be cleared up. The Decline and Fall of Napoleon, 1810 to 1815. Napoleon's hopes of 1810 were not to be realized. 
The continental system rapidly made him more and more unpopular as trades stagnated as tea, coffee, sugar, and tobacco became unobtainable or enormously expensive as ships were laid up and farms closed down. He even found himself compelled to issue licenses for the large-scale importation of certain British goods into France such as boots for his armies. The conscription and taxes he applied as his dependent allies and conquests made matters worse and completely failed to compensate for all the improvements in other directions that his government had made. In 1811 came the revolt which was to prove the beginning of the end. The Tsar, tired of doing without British and overseas goods, annoyed at the annexation of a relatively territory Oldenburg, slighted by Napoleon's marriage with the Austrians rather than the Russian princes, and dissatisfied at Napoleon's failure to help him as his eastern ambition broke away from the continental system. The result was one of the most appalling military disasters in history, the Moscow Campaign. In 1812, with an overwhelming army of six ten thousand men, forced from um, almost every country in Europe, Napoleon crossed the river in Yemen from Russia to teach Alexander his lesson. Before such a force, the Russians could only retreat, and as they retreated, they devastated the country, denuding it of supplies and shelter. The vast invading army could not be fed, Death and disaster carried off thousands so that long before the cold set in, two thirds had disappeared. Napoleon struggled difficulties of supply. Outside the capital, the great battle of the campaign was fought. Borodino, which the French won at the cost of 30,000 horses and 50,000 men, with the dead left seven or eight deep in the field of conflict. Moscow now lay open to the invaders, only from them to find their longed for heaven turned into a raging inferno when the Russians set fires in the cities rather than let them provide shelter for their opponents. After five weeks as the, in the ruined city, Napoleon realized there was nothing to do but turn back, and since Russian armies blocked other routes to retreat over the desolate line of the advance. The dreadful sight and sounds of Borodino had to be encountered again, but one man at least was not sickened. The most beautiful battlefield I have ever seen in my life, remarked Napoleon. By November the cold had come to complete the catastrophe. As they struggled on with Ney in the rear heroically fighting a battle a day against the harassing Russian forces, the emperor realized that his presence was essential in Paris if he was to rebuild the shattered military strength in his empire. As before in Egypt, he left his forces to escape as best they could and hastened ahead back to Europe. By December, there were 60 degrees of frost. Finally, of the 610,000 men who started on the great campaign, a tattered, starving, disorganized, delirious, and shell-shocked remnant of 20,000 recrossed the Niemen. Not more than a thousand were of the further military use. The larger army in history had been completely wiped out. The tide of disaster did not stop at that point. Encouraged by the shattering blow to the French in Russia, Prussia, and later Austria, came to grips with the old enemy, thus forming with Britain and Russia the Fourth Coalition. Prussia, since Jena, had witnessed a remarkable revival of nation spirit and efficiency, although allowed by Napoleon an army of 42,000 men. The Prussians had adopted a system, I mean the Prussians had adopted a system of short service. And so had a reverse about 120,000 strong within three years. 
The Prussian war minister, that is Scharnhorst, had also revised methods of arms stunning and tactics, had achieved universal liability to serve and the abolition of the degrading punishment such as flogging and had completely reorganized the Prussian army military forces. Moreover, Prussian had been fortunate in two steps, I mean, in two statesmen. Stein and Hardenberg, who in five years transformed an almost medieval into a modern state. Stein had secured the emanci emancipation of the serfs, thereby allowing them liberty to leave their ancestral soil and work for wages elsewhere, had broken down restrictions by which certain lands was only for nobles, certain trades for badges, and had abolished the monopolies of the old guilds, had given a measure of municipal self-government, and by allowing the craftsmen and landowners in each town to elect a council, and had set up a new ministry of state which had been lacking before. Competent to deal with all the various provinces in the kingdom of Prussia, Harrensburg's most famous land law had given the peasants two-thirds of their former land as freedom, and the other one going that uh, lords in place of services owed. New patriotic literature had appeared. Education was being reformed. University had been founded at Berlin and Breslau. Prussia at last felt itself not only united in wanting to overthrow Napoleon, but competent to do this, so began the war of liberation. By a miracle of organization, Napoleon within three months of the Russian campaign had a new army of a quarter of a million in the field, but he had enormous odds to face, including yet another powerful opponent, Sweden, whose new ruler, that is a Bidonati, thought one of Napoleon's marshals, declared he was not going to be one of the emperor's custom officials. Bernadotte, having refused to apply the continental system, was tempted to join the allies by the promise of receiving Norway. Against the Prussian forces, Napoleon won three battles, including the big victory of Dresden. But he was becoming less superhumanly active, and he missed an opportunity of following up the retreat. Finally, numbers triumphed. After the Prussians, Austrians, Russians, and Swedes, Swedes I mean, had managed to link up their armies. And at the Battle of Leipzig 1813, sometimes known as the Battle of Nations, the French forced forces were overwhelmed rapidly by the retreat across Germany with the Allies in pursuit. Rejecting a very generous peace offered with which will have given France her natural frontiers and so left her with the Rhineland and Belgium, Napoleon laid himself open to the inevitable and invasion of France. Meanwhile, in the peninsula, Wellington during 1811 had succeeded in liberating Portugal and beginning to fight his way into Spain. In June 1813, after many fierce battles en route, he and his allies defeated George Bonaparte at Victoria and went on to capture Madrid. Thence, they began to push the French back towards the Pyrenees. By the end of 1813, the British, Spanish, and Portugal forces were invading France from the south while their continental allies were about to do so from the east. On the sacred soil of France itself, Napoleon put up a brilliant fight against overwhelming odds. With armies containing youngsters ignorant of off the way to load a rifle, he won four victories before Bulka, the Prussian commander, wisely decided to give up chasing such a military genius and marched again against to the Paris. With the capital of the Massey, I mean at the Massey of the Allies, who by the Treaty of Chatmount had now organized their allies systematically and agreed on some of their peace demands. The French marshals compelled Napoleon 
first to accept terms and then to abdicate. By the Treaty of Fontainebleau, which he ratified after the unsuccessful attempt at suicide, he gave up the throne, but he was allowed the title of emperor, an income of about 200,000 pounds, and the Mediterranean island of Elba as his kingdom. A replacement for Napoleon was already waiting in the wings. Just before his abdication, the French Senate, guided by Talleyrand, a former bishop and foreign minister of the Republic and Napoleon, set up a provision government and arranged for the restoration of the Bourbon line. This was in accordance with the wishes of the Allies. The new king was the elder surviving brother of the executed Louis. He took the title of Louis. And to make his ascension more acceptable to the French, promised to rule by the terms of a charter, which guaranteed a parliament and a constitution. He had some difficulty in living in exile in England promptly on account of the bad attack of gout. The Allies now concluded a peace treaty with the restored monarchy. It was extraordinarily generous since they did not wish either to antagonize France permanently or to make the restored regime and unpopular. By what was later called the first peace of Paris, to distinguish it from the second peace of Paris, in the following year, the Allies stripped France of a great conquest such as Belgium, Holland, and the territories in Germany and Italy, from all of which the French armies had already driven and returned her in the boundaries of the first, in 1st November 1792. This still left her half a million more inhabitants than she had had before in revolt. With ever great forbearance, the Allies demanded no indemnity from France, imposed no army of occupation, and even allowed the French to retrain most of the great workers of art, which Napoleon had pillaged from the European capitals. Apart from this, France had to agree to certain proposed features of the post-war settlement, such as the enlargement of Holland, the formation of a new confederation of the German states, the guaranteed independence of Switzerland, and Australia again in Italy. There, there was, was also, also a colonial, colonial settlement, settlement with Britain, Britain. The, the French, French recognizing the British retention of Malta. Mauritius and two of the French West Indian islands. Nearly all other questions were to be referred to a great European Congress, which was to meet at Vienna. The French would be represented at this, but had to promise and to accept Allied decisions about their redistribution of territory. The satisfactory progress of the war in Europe enabled Britain to pay more attention to a vexation conflict on the other side of the Atlantic. At about the same time as Napoleon invaded Russia and recently formed United States of America declared a war on Britain. The Americans were prompted partly by desire to annex Canada, partly by resentment against British actions at sea. Notably, the prevention of American commerce with French-controlled ports and the seizure of British-born American subjects from American ships. Britain, in fact, was on the point of exempt exempting American vessels from her regulations, and there, or four days after the declaration of war actually did so, but the war still went on. It was fought mainly along the Canadian border, on and around the Great Lakes, and of the American Eastern Seaboard. In general, the American invasion of Canada was successfully restricted, I mean successfully resisted. But at sea, British ships suffered some nasty shocks from the very efficient American vessels until with the close of the war, I mean with the close of the war in Europe, the British strength became irresistible. One memorable incident which created a lasting ill feeling occurred when a British landing party burnt the public buildings of Washington in retaliation for
for a similar America action in Canada. Loss of commerce finally made the war unpopular on both sides, and in December 1814, a peace was signed at Gehent on inconclusive terms. This was too late to stop a British expedition in the following month attacking New Orleans unsuccessfully. The Congress of Vienna opened in North November 1814. Both beforehand and from then on, the Allies strove to thrash out the many problems on which they disagreed. Though the Congress included representatives of nearly all states of Europe, the major bargaining and decision-making was reserved to the four great allies, Britain, Austria, Russia, and Prussia. Their disputes over the future of Poland and Saxony soon reached such a pitch that the chief French delegate, that is Talleyrand, was able to capitalize on the division and bring France into the select group of major decision-makers. He did this by inducing Britain and Austria to join France in an alliance to operate should Russia and Prussia attempt to enforce their ideas by war, as Prussia was threatening. When news of this leaked out, Russia and Prussia moderated their proposals and the Congress got back on a more even nail or kill. This dangerous episode was scarcely over when a still more alarming piece of news burst upon the Congress, the news that Napoleon had decamped from Elba. This galvanized the four main armies into instant action. Within about an hour, they agreed to declare Napoleon an outlaw and renew hostilities against him, a decision in which they were soon joined by many smaller powers. More striking still, they rapidly reached agreement on all the outstanding issues of the European settlement. The final act of the Congress, a document of 121 articles summarizing the agreed decisions, was signed in 9 June 1815, nine days before the last great clash with Napoleon at Waterloo. Of all the episodes in Napoleon's career, none is more remarkable than the hundred days of his rule between the exile of Elba and the exile of St. Helena. He landed at Antibes with only a few hundred soldiers in a country with less than a year before had been I mean, heartily glad to seek the back of him. Louis instantly sent forces to capture him. Marshal Ney vowing that he ought to be brought back in a cage. But the magnetism of Napoleon's personality, the memory of campaigns shared in common, resentment at the loss of the empire, the shabby treatment of the army by the restored Bourbon government, the fear of the peasants that the government was about to confiscate the lands they had acquired at the beginning of the revolution, all led to a very different result. The tactics of Napoleon helped too, for he promised peace and a parliament. He also showed his considerable talent for falsehood when he informed the first troops sent to capture him that he had been summoned to Paris by the Allies. So the soldiers, including him, including Ney, simply fell in behind him and helped him to continue his marches to Paris. Before long, Louis was in flight, while the French newspapers underwent a rapid change of tone. The scoundrel Bonaparte became first Napoleon when finally, our great and beloved emperor. Three weeks were enough for him to establish himself again as master of France. Confronted with the hostility of the Allies, he decided to take the offensive. In 12th June, he marched into Belgium, I mean, to strike at the British and Dutch under Wellington and the Prussians under Bulka before they could be joined by the Austrians and the Russians, whose armies were in distant parts of Europe. The campaign of Waterloo consisted of three main battles. As Napoleon had only half the force of his opponents, he sought to engage them separately. On 6th June, he defeated the Prussian at Ligny, but fatally neglected to follow up the victory. 
The same day he challenged Wellington at Quatres Brass, imagining the Prussians to be in flight. On 18th June at Waterloo, Wellington knew that the Prussians had retired in good order and would probably succeed in joining him during the day. He joined, I mean he therefore stood his ground. While Napoleon, confident that his opponent was a bad general commanding bad troops, flung his men recklessly against Wellington. But the attacks of the French columns for all their dash could not penetrate the thin British lines whose rifle fires were so deadly. And then, Balka appeared in the late afternoon. Napoleon's fate was sealed. In Paris, the parliament demanded his abdication, resisting the temptation to start a civil war for his own throne. He gave in and surrendered to the British on the most generous of his enemies. The compliment, however, cut no ice. Anxious to have no further trouble, the British government banished him to the insatiable island of St. Helena in the South Atlantic. Nearly five months haggling followed between the Allies and France before a new peace treaty was signed. This time, the Allies were not so generous. They determined that the France should make some amendments for the renewed support that she had given to Napoleon. By the second peace of Paris, they made her revert for her boundaries in 1790, thus taking from her part of Savoy, which she wore had occupied early in the revolution, and some frontier areas in the northeast. In addition, they stipulated that France should pay in an indemnity and suffer an army of occupation. They had already insisted on the return of the remaining looted works of art. At the same time, the four great powers of Britain, Austria, Russia, and Prussia renewed their quadruple alliance in case of further trouble with France and promised to meet from time to time for consultation in Congress. Six years after his defeat at Waterloo, Napoleon died in his remote place of exile. He had spent much of his time discussing and arranging the history of his career to present, to present it to the best advantage. Europe will never again be troubled by his brilliant talents, his restless energy, his inflexible will, and his lack of moral sense. With an eye as ever as the best effect of the public opinion, he directed in his will that his ashes should rest by the banks of the Seine in the midst of the French people whom I have loved so much. And this was the man who in 1814 had remarked that he cared little for the lives of million men. In considering an extraordinary success and the equality outstanding failure of Napoleon, it must be remembered that he was a general of unparalleled brilliance. Wellington said that his presence in the British in the field was worth a difference of 40,000 men. But as the years went on, a decline showed itself, not in his talents, but rather in his energy, still tremendous enough, but not quite so superhuman as before. At Lingney, for example, the failure to pursue the Prussians made a vital difference. Even more important is the fact that as the scale of the war grew, as hundreds of thousands instead of tens of thousands became involved, so it inevitably followed that his marshals must direct a greater proportion of the army. And though the marshals were mostly young, talented and brave, they had not Napoleon's genius and they quarreled among themselves in Spain, for example. They refused to help each other's army. And in Russia, one even tried to murder another. When ex marshal Bonadotti, king of Sweden, deserted Napoleon in 1813, the simple advice he gave to his new allies was, when you face the marshals, attack. When you face Napoleon, retreat. But while military reason were, of course, vital in causing both Napoleon's rise and his downfall, other factors were equally important among those 
was the fact that his early days Napoleon was practically carried the French to repress the people's eager to welcome him. To Italians ruled by Austrians as despotic princes, to Poles ruled by Russians or Austrians or Prussians, to Germans looking beyond the hundreds of pretty price, I mean princedoms in Germany, to all dissatisfied with the savior. Even in Britain, Napoleon always relied on being supported by a popular prizing, should he land. In other words, his rise was inspired by the two enormous powerful forces whose history makes up so much of the history of the 19th century, the forces of liberalism and patriotism. Strangely enough, or perhaps not so strangely, these same two forces contributed powerfully to his downfall. While he thought against governments which lacked a liberal or popular backing, he was consistently successful. But when the middle of lower classes fell in strongly behind their governments, he began to fail. German rebels, for example, stand against him wholeheartedly after 1806, when French dominating, the I mean domination had proved to give them little freedom. The Italians, the Swiss, the Dutch were all overtaxed. In Russia and Spain, in the French Revolution, doctrines made no impression at all on the very backward people. And here he was faced with disaster right from the beginning. Further, after his introduction of continental system, the middle of I mean, and lower classes in every city felt an effect of his rule in high prices, strict customs, rules, and declining trade. Everywhere, the tide of patriotism sentiment, whether national or local, turned against Napoleon, and he was defeated largely by the hostility of those whose good will had enabled him earlier to triumph. Finally, it is obvious that Napoleon, in his increasingly in increasing pride and self-confidence, and in his determination to beat Britain, simply took on too much. To beat Britain, he proclaimed the continental system. To maintain that system, he had to control the whole of Europe. It was a task beyond the power of any one man or any one nation, even when the man was Napoleon and the nation was France. Even. If he crushed all Europe utterly, he would have gone on to the Turkish Empire, to India, and to the Americas. A restless demon of energy drove him on. A demon he imagined himself was aware of when he loved to picture himself as the man of destiny. Driven by fate, his schemes were all too big. He simply could not last. If he, if the end had not come, at Waterloo, it would surely have come at another battle a little later. What then is the significance of the career of Napoleon Bonaparte? To France he gave durable instructions, institutions, I mean, and the social benefits of the revolution. To Europe, he gave a test of modern government and as such a stare that a vast new force began to be aroused, including those of liberalism in Germany and Italy, and the beginning of nationalism. To the world, he gave an appalling example of the damage that can be caused by a colossal talents corrupted by our overwhelming desire of power. Former Austrian Netherlands, that is Belgium, with the United States, Holland, to form a new kingdom of the Netherlands under the House of Orange. This also served to compensate Holland for the loss of the colonial, I mean, her colonies in Britain. Another check to France was to build up of the build-up of Austria power in northern Italy, an arrangement which also compensated Austria for surrendering her part of the Netherlands. Not only did Austria recover Lombardy and supply Habsburg rulers for the three central duchies of modern Parma and Tuscany, but she also retained Vienna, including the city of Venice and much 
of the Dalmatian coast. The Italian barrier against France was also strengthened by allocating Genova or Genoa to a kingdom of Sardinia. Both Genoa and Venice had been great republics of the days before the armies of the French Revolution broke in Italy, and had the course, I mean Congress, been solemnly concerned by legitimacy, they should have been restored as republics. But the Congress was also concerned for compensation and with forming a strong ring around France. So Genoa and Venice had to swallow the loss of their former independence. Republics, as Alexander put it crisply, they are no longer fashionable. Elsewhere in the Italian peninsula, however, legitimacy could be applied. The Pope recovered all his former territory, and further south the Spanish Bourbon monarchy was restored in Naples and Sicily. Murat, king of Naples, who had helped the Allies in 1814, had rejoined Napoleon during the Hundred Days, and so could be shot without compaction. So, Prussia, Austria, Sardinia, and Holland had their rewards and compensations. And rotting thrones were propped up against in southern Italy and Spain. What was Russia's reward apart from the resurrection of a Poland under Russia kingship? The main answer lay in recognition of two gains recently made by Russia in the course of fighting powers other than France. Her acquisition of Finland from Sweden and Brasemia from Turkey. But Sweden had deserted Napoleon and been of great service to the Allies from 1812 onwards. If she had to surrender Finland to Russia and Pruskinia to Prussia, how should she be compensated? The answer had already been spelled out when she joined the Allies. She should have Norway, which would also keep or help to make a strong single power in the north. And who lost Norway? Denmark punished like Saxony for remaining too late in Napoleon's camp, though in this case she was given minor compensation elsewhere. Actually, at some time or other, all the main powers except Britain had collaborated, I mean, with Napoleon, and which of them got punished for doing so became, as Talleyrand put it, a question of date. But it was not only that. It was also a question of being a small power and able to resist the larger ones. Britain's rewards for her very strenuous efforts had already been settled by previous agreements. Her main gains apart from the islands of the West Indies included recognition of her possession of Ceylon, the Cape of Good Hope for which she had made money payment to the Dutch, Mauritius, Guyana, Malta, the Ionia Island and Heligoland. Armed with such additional or additions to her empire, Britain was able to develop still further her commercial and maritime supremacy. The new organization in Germany to replace the old Holy Roman Empire and its successor, Napoleon's Confederation of the Rhine, occupied by much discussion before, agreed, was reached. In the end, the 38 remaining states of Germany, including the major ones like Prussia, Brevia, and Hanova, now enlarged into a kingdom, agreed to form a German confederation under the presidency of Austria. It was to have a diet or parliament, with representatives of each state, but with very limited authority. Almost all powers remained with the individual states, who looked to the confederation not to run everyday matters but to harmonize foreign policy and prevent the member states including alliance hostiles to each other. So the map of Europe was redrawn and the weak points became easy enough to set as time went on. In particular, the Congress ignored one of the new factors which had helped to bring about the downfall of Napoleon, that is, the rise of national feeling. Nations and people were banded about 
as though they were goods. To supply compensation here or constitute a barrier state there. Norwegians, Belgians, Boers, Finns, Italians, Serbs, Poles were placed under foreign governments. They soon intensely disliked. Very little was done so to satisfy the desire of the Poles and of the German. Many Germans awakened by Napoleon's work for large and powerful states to represent their nationality. Nothing at all in the direction was done for the Italians, since the growth of the nationalism proved to be one of the main currents of the 19th century, was inevitably occurred to upset the treaty. One by one, as time wore on its provision were cancelled and nearly always by force. This, however, is, the judge, is to judge the settlement from the vantage point of the future. The past at Vienna did not see anything very wicked in foreign rule, for it had been common throughout history. They did not, it is true, perceive the strength of this rising force of nationalism, but the aggressive nationalism that they had recently seen that of France seemed to them a threat to Europe's civilization and a danger that must be contained. So they restored the old regime and sought to strengthen by territorial additions the powers most likely to keep France in check. At the same time, by their hard bargaining among themselves, they tried to prevent on any of their own numbers becoming too dominant. They sought, in other words, to avoid further or future trouble by preserving some sort of balance of power. In their desire to prevent future trouble, the powers also agreed to a new departure in European politics. By the terms of their quadruple alliance as renewed in the Second Treaty of Paris in November 1815, Russia, Austria, Prussia and Britain agreed not only to ally if necessary in defense of the post-war settlement, but to meet in future congresses to discuss problems as occasions arose. The arrangement contained the germs of the League of Nations or United Nations ideas except that it was confined to the four great powers and so had a dictatorial slant from the beginning. The conception was particularly, I mean, castrilious, though he was later to disapprove of the way the other powers tried to use the alliance. Sometimes confused with this practical attempt to lessen the conflicts of the great powers in another agreement concluded in the month after Waterloo and known as the Holy Alliance. This was not a military compact, but a league of heads of states who promised to rule on Christian principles acting as fathers of their people and brothers to each other. It was the creation of the religious and well-meaning Alexander and had no effect worth mentioning. Castoria disapproved it, terming it a piece of sublime mysticism and nonsense. Matanik called it a loud-sounding nothing and said that the Tsar's mind was quickly clearly affected. But though no one except Alexander took it seriously, every sovereign in Europe signed it. With the exception of the Sultan who, not being a Christian, had not been invited. George III who was insane, and the Pope. It was one of those amiable gestures of goodwill which people sign because they sympathize with its object and because they know there is no particular provision for carrying them out of it, do so will prove inconvenience. The confusion of the quadruple alliance arose because liberal Europe in Euro liberals in Europe finding the adjective holy in connection with the arch conservative matanich too rich to forget, insisted on referring to the Russia-Austrian-Prussia grouping as the Holy Alliance. Both the Quadruple Alliance and the Holy Alliance then were intended to help preserve the peace and the atmosphere of the Brotherhood. 
They were, in fact, a quite original attempt to improve the lot of mankind. Unfortunately, however, the problem of peace is a lonely one. In the absence of international government or enforced arbitration, peace implies keeping territories and their ownership arranged as they are, except in the rare cases where both parties to a dispute can agree on a peaceful alteration. But what if one side feels genuine injustice and the other refuses to remedy the grievances? The Italians in Lombardy might have appealed peacefully for a century to the Austrians to clear out without anything coming out of it. In such cases, it is possible that keeping the peace may perpetuate what one side passionately keeps feels to be wrong. Even nowadays, when there are international organizations ready to settle disputes, as there were not then people often feel so strongly that they prefer to fight rather than accept the verdict of arbitration. This was the problem with the 1814 to 1815 settlements. There soon proved to be many people who longed either to throw off their foreign rulers or else to claim a constitution and a parliament. But everywhere the quadruple alliance was anxious to keep the peace. Thus it, did not it is not difficult to see what the alliance so good in intention developed into. Directed by men who had spent their whole lives in fighting the French Revolution and its heir, Napoleon, it was inevitable that the alliance should regard extreme nationalism and democracy of the French kind as wicked delusions which had plunged Europe into bloodshed. So the alliance became, in effect, a kind of trade union of kings in possession to stop the possibility of peoples in possession. As this aspect it, of it came more to the force of incurred the hatred of liberians all over Europe, the British support of it grew more and more lukewarm. The guiding spirit became not Castori, with his practical common sense, nor Alexander with his religious enthusiasm, but the supreme anti-liberal Metternich. Metternich well knew that to give free reign to either democracy or nationalism will smash the ramshackle Australian Empire into pieces, for in it lived Germans, Poles, Zechs, Croats, Slovaks, Rutherans, Mayans, Serbs, and Italians, all more or less restrained by Vienna. And it was Matarich who had declared that democracy could only change daylight into darkness night and who had attacked the idea of the French Revolution as the disease which must be cured, the volcano which must be extinguished, the gingers which must be burned out with the hot iron, the hydra with jaws open to swallow up the social order. The latter Congress and the breakdown of the alliance in 1818 to 1830. In 1815, the reactionary side of the quadruple alliance was not yet an uppermost, and the alliance approached their problem in a reasonably constructive way. The first which they had to tackle in the post-war period was the position of France. France had proved punctual in the discharge of her obligations, but was naturally resenting the army of occupation. In 1818, a congress of the four powerless met at Aix la Chapelle, and there it was unanimously agreed to withdraw the army of occupation and to invite France to cooperate in future congress. The alliance thus admitted France very quickly to what became called the Concert of Europe, and so prevented her previous enmity becoming long-lasting. At the same time, however, the Allies took precautions. They secretly renewed their quadruplitic alliances to operate against France if need be, and confidentially informed the leading French representative that they had done so. In other respects, too, the Congress was a great success. 
Agreement was reached on the protection of Jews in Europe, on Swedish debts to Denmark, and on treatment of Bonaparte on St. Helena, and on all matters of the British claim to the Channel salute. Significantly, however, the powers could not agree on a jointly expedition to punish the notorious Barbary pirates because of fear of Russian vessels in the Mediterranean. Above all, on one highly important matter there was considerable disagreement before Russian pressure gave way. These two powers wanted the quadruptic alliance to guarantee not only all the frontiers established at Vienna but all the governments. In other words, it would be the alliance's duty to intervene, to intervene whether there was a successful revolution in any country in Europe. Prussia even wanted an international army under Wellington to be kept at Brussels in his purpose. Kasli, however, managed to uh, secure an agreement limiting prominent interventions to the case of France. It, if she should gain, uh, I mean again undergo a revolution, which obviously threatened the peace of Europe. His argument was masterly. Nothing will be more immoral than the idea that force was collectively to be prostituted to the support of established power without any consideration of the extent to which it was abused. Till there was perfect justice everywhere, he maintained, it would be wrong to guarantee all existing governments. In opposing the Russian and Prussian plan, Castile was firmly support I mean, was firmly supported by his colleagues in the British cabinet, including Lord Liverpool, the Prime Minister and the former Foreign Secretary and brilliant orator George Canning, who was now re-establishing himself as a great political figure. Many years earlier, Canning had criticized the Kasli for incompetence in organizing the Welchirian expeditions, and the two had fought a duel in which Canning was wounded. Now they were reconciled, and Canning heartedly shared Castle's desire to avoid foreign commitments which could involve Britain in intervention beyond her own spheres of interest. The British view of a limited alliance triumphed for the moment. The Congress of Aix la Chapelle broke up after the powers had agreed to meet again whenever necessary. The meeting had been the first conference of the European powers ever to be held except to make up a peace treaty to the end of the war. Not surprisingly then, the idea of holding Congress from time to time appeared to Kasli as a new discovery in the European government, at once extinguishing the cobwebs with which diplomacy obscures the horizon, bringing the whole bearing of the system into its true light and giving to the councils of the great powers the efficiency and almost the simplicity of a single state. This verdict, however, proved over-optimistic. In fact, the very term Congress system which historians have traditionally applied to the experiment suggests that Europe was more closely regulated by Congress as this, at this time than the actual in case. There was a genuine effort to produce a unified policy among the great powers, but their interests were too diverse for their efforts to have much success. Unfortunately, any hopes that Europe had suddenly discovered the way to govern itself peaceably was soon dashed. By 1820, there was a rising tide of protest against established governments in the spirit of arrangements of Vienna. In Spain, in that year, a revolution against the restored Bourbons forced King Ferdinand, King Ferdinand to grant a constitution that was very liberal for the time. It had been originally drawn up in 1812 during the revolt against John Bonaparte. A similar revolution followed in Portugal, while on the other side of the Atlantic, the Spanish colonies which had thrown off the rule of Spain during the war, still refused to acknowledge the rights of their mother country over them. In Italy, there was restlessness everywhere. 
fomented by the, I mean, Carbonari, a secret society aiming at liberalism in the expulsion of foreign rulers. In 1820 saw a major revolution in Italy soil, the Spanish Bourbon king of Naples being compelled to adopt a constitution similar to the Spanish one in 1812. The following year, the king of Sardinia also had to grant liberal reforms after agitation in Piedmont. Other countries were also affected. In Germany, where some of the state's rulers granted constitutions from 1816 onwards, university students agitated from German Union in the national constitution. A highly point came in 1819 when a student assassinated a leading opponent of these ideas that is Kurt Zebue, an anti-liberal writer of a secret Russian spy. In England, between 1816 and 1820, there were riots in Spa, and, uh, I mean, uh, at Spa fields, brutal acts of repression like a pre massacre and even a plot to murder the whole cabinet. In France in 1820, the popular young Duke of Berry, who was in the line to inherit the throne, was murdered as he left the Paris Opera House. Events like this shook the Tsar out of his earlier liberal tendencies. Backed by France, he demanded the calling of a new Congress where measures might be consent, I mean consented against such violence. In 1820, the Congress duly met in Trapu, in Australian Silesia, to consider these and similar problems. Already by this time, the German Confederation, on the suggestion of Metrinich, had taken powers notably by the Kalsbas decrees to suppress revolutions in its compon I mean component states. Kasliria knew before the start of the Congress that the object of Metrinich and the Tsar was to use the alliance to put down the revolution in Naples and Spain, and perhaps even to restore the latter her revolt America colonies, but through Castri, like Maltrinich, detested revolutionary movement, he was not prepared to see Britain associated with the other two powers in wholesale revolution breaking. His reason was threefold. Partly that there had existed genuine grievances in Naples and Spain. Principally that internal affairs of other countries were no business on Britain, where they did no direct interference with her interests. Britain thus refused to join the declaration of the other three powers at Tropau concerning their right to intervene to suppress the revolutions. Indeed, Kasli even declared to take part in the Congress sending instead of a participant, only an observer, as did France. The Congress, coupled with the, I mean, its uh, continuation in La Bianuch in 1821, in fact, had two direct results. One was the Austrian intervention in Naples and Piedmont with Congress approval to restore the kings concerned to their full powers to suppress the recently granted constitutions. The other was the beginning of a split within the Quadruple Alliance. In 1821, the situation had been still further complicated by a revolt of the Greeks against their Turkish rulers. The Greeks gambled on receiving help from their fellow Orthodox Christians. The Russians, who were notoriously eager to break up the Ottoman Empire and extend their influence south of the Mediterranean. Britain and Austria, on the other hand, were equally anxious to uphold Turkey as a bulwark against Russian expansion. The Tsar himself was faced with a difficulty problem should he help fellow Christians and extend Russian influence or should he show his usual disapproval of revolutions. For the moment, Castria and Metrinich were able to play on Alexander's fondness for the alliance to hold Russian of Turkey. The Greek revolt broke out while the Congress of Laibach was meeting. To consider it more fully together with the question of Spain and her colonies, a new Congress was called to meet in Verona in 1822. Before this Congress could meet, Kasli 
worn by incessant labors and saddened by his unpopularity among the British liberals and working classes, he suffered a mental breakdown. With a typical efficiency through left and I mean through left and guarded for only two or three minutes, he succeeded in cutting his throat. His position as British Foreign Secretary was filled by Cunning, who by now was positively anxious to break up the European alliance. Castria himself, by refusing to associate Britain to the suppressing of revolutions in Spain, the Spanish colonies, that is Naples and Piedmont, was already drifting apart from Russia, Prussia, and Australia. Kenning went further, unlike Castria, he was not one of the original framers of the alliance. He had no parents' fondness for it, and was eager to assist rather than prevent the demise. The more so because his sympathies were more liberal than Castria's. At the Congress of Verona in 1822, then, the British representative Wellington was instructed to take a firm stand against Allied intervention in Spain. France, however, was ready to intervene on her own responsibility, and she later secured promises of support from Russia, Prussia, and Austria. Within an year, French troops restored King Ferdinand to complete power. Free to take revenge, he set up the Inquisition once more and imprisoned and executed so many of the rebels that France and her supporters grew ashamed of the monarch they had helped. Now that absolute monarchy was restored in Spain came the crux of the matter. Would the king, backed by France, go on to reclaim his rebellious Latin America colonies? On this point, Canning's views and policy soon proved decisive. South and Central America offered valuable outlets for British trade, which had gained a hold, while Spain was powerless during Napoleonic Wars. Spain now refused to promise open trading conditions for Britain with her colonies if she should recapture them. Therefore, quite simply, Spain must not be allowed to recover her lost possessions. Moreover, the problem was soon not confined to the colonials of Spain. In September 1822, Brazil proclaimed its independence of Portugal. The warning to the alliance not to inter fear in Latin America came from two directions, Britain and the United States. For the first, Canning warned Polignac, the French ambassador in London, that Britain would fight France if she attempted to intervene in America. By this time, the United States, fearful of Russia operations in America and the claims she might develop through her I mean ownership of Alaska, and seeing the drift of Kenning's policy, had already granted official recognition to four of the new and struggling Latin American republics, Colombia, Chile, Buenos Aires, and Mexico. Now at the close of 1823, the United States President Monroe, in a message to the U.S. Congress, warned Europe that America was not open to further European colonization and that any interference by the European powers on the American continent will be regarded as the manifestation of an unfriendly disposition to the United States of America. Seeing this cue taken up, Kenning promptly welcomed the Monroe Doctrine and before very long, when the last Spanish troops in America were defeated, recognized three of the same four Latin American republics. Faced with the prospects of fighting both Britain and the United States if the alliance persisted in interference, Austria, Russia, Prussia, France drew back and let revolution triumph in Latin America. Thus, the principle of interference was defeated, and mainly by Britain, who, in so doing, had split up the alliance. 
The Congress system was now on its last legs. Its death blow was soon to complete or to come over the question of Greek independence. The Greek Revolt The Greek Revolt had by the time reached a critical stage. In 1824, the Sultan called upon his powerful vassal, Mehmet, Ali of Egypt, for help. The Mehmet Ali's son, Ibrahim Pasha, was soon suppressing the rebels with a brutality which threatened to leave the Sultan with no Greek subjects at all. In 1825 too, Tsar Alexander died and was succeeded by his brother Nicholas I, a man of more stable and determined character, who was resolved to help his fellow Orthodox Christians in Greece. Seeing that Nicholas in any case meant to help the Greeks, Canning decided it would be wise to associate Britain with the action, to give her a voice in the subsequent peace settlement and to stop Russia monopolizing the benefits of intervention. He therefore acted with Russia to control her, and in 1827, by the Treaty of London, Britain, Russia, and France agreed to secure independence in all but name for Greece. Against this policy, Prussia and Austria protested strongly, being anxious both to discover or discourage rebellion and to preserve the Balkan Peninsula for their own influence. The intervention ended by the British, French, and Russian fleets destroying the Turkish and Egyptian navy almost accidentally at Navarino Bay and therefore making certain of independence for the Greeks. But it had another effect too. Since the powers of Europe were so hopelessly divided over the matter, it could no longer be pretended that there was any effective quadruple or quintuple alliance or quintuple alliance, sorry, the Congress system was dead. So on, the questions of intervention in Italy, Spain, and Spanish colonies in Greece, Britain had gradually drawn away from her continental allies. Canning indeed almost re revealed in the work of destroying the first experiment in international cooperation, saying after the Congress of Verona, things are getting back to a wholesome state again. Every nation for itself and God for us all. The Congress system thus broke down in the first place because vital issues arose, such as the matter of the Spanish colonies on which Britain could not possibly agree with the other powers. In the second place, it never captured the sympathy of European public opinion, even in a way that the League of Nations was to do. This was partly because it did not represent the small powers and partly because the views and characters of men like Materini and Alexander after 1820 made the alliance appear something like a league of despots for the suppression of liberty, constantly arguing intervention to put down a popular movement, I mean movements. Dudley, so as often after the end of the war, Britain began to object to the policy of continental obligations which the war had rendered necessary. There came the inevitable desire to have a free hand, to be without alliance and commitments with, or I mean which will certainly involve the country in war against, again, if another European conflict developed. This, indeed, was one of the chief factors which prompted Kenning to destroy the Congress system. In helping time, Kenning actually claimed to be resisting the spirit of foreign domination. It is in this light as a factor in the light for freedom that Kenning's and Britain's opposition to the alliance had often been presented. British historians have frequently depicted Kenning as a sort of George the Giant Killer, I mean, battling against the wicked Russia and Austrian ogres, when what he has really doing was returning to Britain's standard post-war policy in those days of isolation. We can easily exaggerate Britain's liberalism if we close sight of the fact that 
Castagheri, who, for example, was lead, the leading spirit in uh, the Turoi government, which approved the, I mean, the Pitalu massacre, and uh, uh, ruthless opposed all working class political movements at home. Kenning's resistance to foreign domination did not go deep either, as to make him question the existence of the British Empire, much of which was founded on it. Britain, I mean, thus destroyed the Congress system a little out of love of constitutional liberty, but more, much more from the desire to avoid unnecessarily con continental obligations and because of the alliance threatening Britain interests, it's important to pocket touching matters such as trade with the former Spanish colonies. France under the Bourbon and the Orleans monarchies. The restored Bourbons, 1850. The final defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo in 1815 meant for France the second return of the Bourbon line in the pass, I mean, persons of Louis. Already previously restored by the Allies in 1814, he had left Paris when the news of Napoleon's landing from Elba was announced with a speed remarkable in view of his advancing age and figure. Now in 1815 he was back again to exhibit in his fat, gouty and unromantic frame the divine rights of kings. This, however, did not mean that the whole gain of the revolutionary and Napoleon periods were lost and that France simply went back to the position before 1789. Louis, a sensible old gentleman, retained most of Napoleon's great institutions, such as the Code, the University, the Legion of Honor, and the system of local government. Also, he had, as mentioned before, promised no rule constitutionally by the terms of the Qatar. This Qatar, a suggestion of the Allies in 1814 to make Louis return less unpopular, was of great importance. Its main effect was to provide France with a parliament and to prevent any return to absolute government. All Frenchmen were to be subject to the same system of law. All were to be freed from the possibility of arbitrary imprisonment by letters de cut. And all were to be equally eligible for important civil and military positions. Furthermore, liberty was granted in the form of three press. Though the government could suppress abuse of this and of complete religion tolerance, though Catholicism was recognized as France's official religion, the middle classes' fears were quickened by a provision that those who had bought confiscated property during the revolution were entitled to keep it. All known, the, I mean, the extreme theories and uh, practices of 1791, the new parliament seemed very undemocratic. The upper chamber of peers was uh, nominated entirely by the king, and though the lower chamber of deputies was appointed by indirect election voters, had to be over 30 years of age and pay at least 300 francs in direct taxes. Deputies had to be over 40 and to pay direct taxes at, at, of at least 1,000 francs. In a population of 29 million, less than 100,000 people had the right to vote. Here was a sure source of future trouble. Louis in 1815 was in some way in a very similar position to Charles II of England in 1660, willing to be, I mean, to let the, the bike by chiefly anxious not to go. Like Charles II, he found himself surrounded by groups of returned nobles who were fiercely keen to recover their positions and revenge themselves on their late enemies. We continue. Of these nobles, the relentless leader was Charles Count of Arotio. 
the king's younger brother, so just as the English royalists of 1660 savagely persecuted the Cromwellians against all the wishes of Charles, so the French royalists in 1815 returned in full strength by the upper middle class to the chamber of deputies, savagely persecuted the Bonapartists against all the advice of Louis. A white terror took place in 1815 to 1816, both before the elections and afterwards, in the course of which some 7,000 supporters of Napoleon were imprisoned, uh, mean, imprisoned, massacred, and executed. Marshal Ney, bravest of the brave who had set off to capture Napoleon and fallen in behind him, was shot after a trial before the peers. These excesses in turn produced the opposite reaction and by 1817, when the upper middle class had lost their panic-stricken fear of Bonapartism, the more moderate outlook of Louis began to take effect. Till 1820, Parliament and Louis then proceeded along fairly conciliatory lines. All at once, however, the extreme royalists, or ultras, as they were called, were presented with a magnificent opportunity in the matter of Bonapartists of the Duke of Berry, a son of the Count of Artois. Berry was next in line to the throne, after Artois, as Louis had no surviving children. The assassin who stabbed him as he was leaving the Paris Opera home imagined that the deed could result in the end of the Bourbon dynasty. The ultras were of course not slow to see the parliament that liberalism and Bonapartism must be stamped out. So by 1822, when a severe law was passed, limiting the freedom of the press and trial by jury, the short moderate phrase of Bourbon rule was ending. Louis too succumb, uh, succumbing to a diabetic, uh, I mean gangrene, was almost literally breaking up. His valet was horrified one day to discover pieces of the king's toes inside the royal stockings. He had just pulled off. Louis was thus without the physical reserves to resist the artists and the ultras. In Spain, for instance, as we have seen, the French under ultra-inspiration intervened to restore the absolute rule of the unsavory Ferdinand. All the same, by the time Louis' reign closed in 1824, a great deal had been done for France by his government. A heavy war indemnity paid off. The country, rid of the foreign occupying troops, the army reorganized under Marshal Saint Sai, and France readmitted to the ranks councils and alliance of the great powers. Moreover, although the parliament was undemocratic and best and beset by troubles, it was educating the nation. Though the speeches of its many talented members in most of the great issues of the time. The reign of Artois, who ascended the throne of Charles X, was almost bound to come to grief before long if Louis was the Charles II of French history. Charles X was the James II. He longed to restore the France monarchy to all ancient powers, and despite constitutional kingship, I had rather chop wood than reign after the fashion of the king of England, he said. Further, he had as passionate a conviction as Robespierre that the enemies were not only mistaken but sinful. The first acts of his reign were typical. For his coronation, he revived all the ancient medieval ceremony. While he lay prostrate on cushions, he was pierced in seven parts of his body through seven apertures of his clothes with a golden needle dipped in holy oil said to have been miraculously preserved from the 5th century. He then visited hospitals to heal the diseased by his holy touch. Before long, an act was passed making prof pro I mean, profession of the holy sacrament in church punishable by death.
and every encouragement was given to the religious revival which had set in against the excesses of the revolutionary period. The religious orders were quickly allowed to return. The Jesuits re-emerged as an important force and nunneries flourished abundantly. To those who still harbored revolutionary sentiments, further affront was given by an act not unwise in itself, which granted a thousand million francs compensation to those who had been dispossessed of their property by the revolution. These things were not done without opposition, which in turn only served, however, to harden Charles's opinions. In fact, in the growing protests of the liberal and Bonapartists, he resolved not to compromise, for compromise, in his opinion, had brought down Louis. He therefore dismissed the last of his moderate royalist councillors and appointed as his chief minister the Prince D. Plorignan, a former prisoner of Napoleon and an ultra of the ultras. Events now moved fast forwards, I mean, towards their conclusion. Polignac's aims were simple to reorganize society, to give back to the clergy their weight in their states, to create a powerful aristocracy and to surround it with privileges, a program which would have largely cancelled out the revolution. To carry it out, he had so claimed the assistance of visions from the Virgin Mary. Opposition to him quickly boiled up even in Parliament, which approached Charles with a closing, a min I mean choosing a minister who did not represent them. Charles's answer was the one which might have been expected of him to dissolve Parliament. The new elections, however, showed an ever greater majority against Polignac. Charles, therefore, to deal with this situation, issued in July 1830 a series of drastic proclamations known as the Ordinances of St. Cloud. By the terms of these ordinances, even stricter laws were passed to control the press. The newly elected parliament was declared dissolved before it met, and three quarters of the electors were deprived of their right to vote. The whole effect would have been to destroy the cutter. At last you are ruling, said Charles's daughter-in-law, with more enthusiasm than accuracy. The opposition was instantaneous, despite the fact that almost at this moment the government scored a great success abroad by the capture of Algiers. Foremost among the protesters against the ordinances were the very printers who were supposed to set up the ordinances and the journalists whose livelihoods were threatened by the enslavement of the press. Their leader in the pre I mean, uh, preliminary agitation was a writer, that is Adolf Diaz, whose name is to recur many times in the history of the next 40 years. It was not he, however, whose action was decisive. While the liberal deputies and the upper middle classes were still wondering what to do, the working classes had not taken action. The revolutionary tradition was strong in Paris and it did not take long for a mob under Republican leaders to seize the Hotel de Ville, Notre Dame, some important guards' house and arsenals and crown their captures with a fluttering tricolor. The troops, the, when uh, anyway, had no great enthusiasm for the Bourbons and were unable to make headway against the barricades of the populace constructed by cutting down the trees of the boulevards and tearing up the paving stones. The disheartened soldiers had no food, owing to the fact that the rebels had captured the military bakeries. Yet even at this stage of the revolt, Charles and Apollignac did not realize the gravity of the situation. The latter, comforted by a fresh vision from the Virgin Mary, declared that a couple of hours, four men and a corporal will settle the whole business. But the next day, the mob uh, proceeded to route the, to, to rout the troops who were guarding the Tuileries. Seeing the 
evident success of the popular insurrection, the middle class deputies realized that they had better take advantage of it. And Theas returned from the day he had been taxifully spending in the country. Charles now in haste offered to dismiss Fort Polignac and restore the full terms of the cutter, but the time was passed for such concessions. Events were fast moving towards the re-establishment of a republic when Theas on 30th July had the walls of Paris posted with placards in favor of Louis Philippe, Duke of Orleans, head of the younger branch of the Bourbon line. He was a prince who might be calculated to appeal to uh, middle and lower classes since he was the son of the Duke of Orleans. Philippe Egalite, who had voted for his cousin Louis' death and had fought on a revolutionary side at Gemapis. But he was not well known and when a day later he appointed at I mean, he appeared at Hotel de Ville to receive the call of the people. His reception was distinctly lukewarm until he embraced the veteran Republican Lafayette and received from his hand the sacred tricolor. The main fact, however, was that at the critical moment, Diaz had produced a candidate when all was confusion and so the claims of Charter X, or I mean Charles X, sorry, and the grandson in whom favor he had soon abdicated and the republic for which the revolutionaries had been fighting were pushed into the background. Charles X and his family were soon on ship for England. And Louis Philippe for Orleans and uh, citizen king was king of the French on condition he ruled as a constitution monarchy. The Orleans monarchy in 1830 to 1848. The reign of Louis Philippe proved to be 18 years of disappointment. Clever, sensible, kindly, and well intentioned, and yet came to grief in an even more indignified way than his predecessor. Apparently, with much to attract the people to him, his revolutionary parentage and past his years of poverty during which he had earned his living by giving lessons in drawing and mathematics, his simple and unaffected ways, he nevertheless failed to capture the true loyalty of any major group apart from the wealthier middle classes. The old royalists despised his democratic habits of lighting his own sturdy fire, shaving himself, living principally on soup, and strolling around the shops with no greater protection than an internal umbrella. They thought nothing of his proudest accomplishment that he had learnt in exile from a waiter with whom he shared lodgings. How to calm harm and beautifully, I mean, thin slices. The working classes equally disliked his government for this simple reason that though it was their blood which had established it. It did not, it did almost nothing to improve their lot. The consequence was that throughout his reign there were plots to attempt to assassinate him, which Louis Philippe for his part met with cheerful and unfailing courage. He had some amazing escapes. Once an eternal machine consisting of an arrangement of 24 musketeers to be fired simultaneous mowed down the front of his bodyguard in a procession, one of the bullets gazing his chin. Another time a bullet lodged in his hair, but he was quite unperturbed. It was only in hunting time, or hunting me, that there is no close season, he remarked. The problems of which faced his government were immense. In the first place, he had to secure recognition for his ascension from Europe power, which frightened two of French, I mean, uh, revolutions, might have been tempted to intervene to restore Charles X. Nicholas I of Russia indeed nearly did only 
he was soon too busy to sup- I mean suppressing a Polish rebellion against himself but by an inflexible policy of peace much of this was distasteful to certain elements in France Louis Philippe calmed down the fears of the powers and uh, first of all winning over the new Whig foreign secretary in Britain's Palmerston he soon secured general recognition to do this however he had to sacrifice certain opportunities of action which would have appealed strongly to a large selection of the French the first such occasion was the Belgian revolt in 1830 the Belgians forcibly joined with the Dutch by the decision of the victorious allies in 1814 to 1815 had resented the union ever since their chief grievances arose from the use of dutch as a for some purposes the only official language the religious differences between catholic belgium and protestant holland and the fact that the dutch practically monopolized all official positions At one time for example six cabinet ministers out of seven were dutch as were that out of that nine abazendas all the nine generals the belgians it is true were allowed to have the total number of mps but as there were three and a half million belgians two million are dutch and even this struck them as unrepresentative and unfair further a sum of the offending the dutch king these men constantly voted with the dutch against their own compatriots this by giving the dutch a majority led to major laws being passed against the belgian interest bread for example the main article of laws in general to tender of favor the dutch commercial and sea farming uh, i mean seafaring interests rather than the belgian industry ones the inclined and inclined to the dutch preferences for free trade rather than the belgium desire for protection belgian newspapers too were severely censored the consequence of all this was a steadily growing state of unrest leading to mass petitions against dutch injustice then came the july revolution in paris and one or two high-handed actions by the dutch king extremists plotted a revolution in brussels and the action began when students and others poured out from a performance of an opera dealing sympathetically with a rising in naples against the spanish and rioted in imitation the dutch army was successfully resisted other towns followed the example of brussels and soon a national congress had declared belgium to be independent of holland a separate constitutional monarchy was voted with the usual constitutions of two houses of parliament liberty of speech and worship and so on by the standards of the time this constitution was exceptionally liberal meanwhile what was the attitude of france and other powers will they accept such a cancellation of one important part of the 1814 or 1815 sentiment there was no doubt of france's answer to the difficulty of louis philippe so far he had been to restrain the enthusiastic french from rushing to the help of the belgians fortunately the other powers too in conference at london agreed to accept belgian independence and offered to guarantee the neutrality of the new state but only on condition that belgium shouldered over half the debt of the netherlands did not include luxembourg in its boundaries and chose a king of whom the powers approved The Belgians announced at the terms promptly invited Louis Philippe's son to be the new king knowing that this would be highly disagreeable to everyone except France Louis Philippe was now faced with a delicate choice if he accepted on behalf of his son he would risk involving France in another European war while if he did not would offend his own people He was firm and sensible enough to refuse and to agree to a British nomination. 
Prince Leopold of Saxe Kolbach, the future Queen of Victoria's uncle. The Belgians then accepted Leopold and there was no European war about the matter. But there was a general feeling in France that Louis Philippe had been outmaneuvered by Pelmanston and his prestige suffered accordingly. In fact, however, he was able to recover a little of his reputation when in 1831 the Dutch King William, who had refused to accept the power's decision, invaded Belgium. The Dutch started sweeping all before them in a brilliant 10-day campaign, and Louis Philippe was hastily authorized by the powers to intervene to protect Belgium. This he did successfully, and so was able to claim that France after, I mean, all had aided Belgian independence. Nevertheless, he was obviously only going as far as Britain allowed him, and this cautious and pacific policy struck Frenchmen brought up on the Napoleonic traditions as distinctly inglorious. Eventually, the whole matter of Belgian independence was concluded in 1839, when the Dutch king, after some years of sulking about the matter, cleverly accepted the power's original terms. He thus got back Luxembourg, which the Belgians had holden meanwhile. The powers then signed a treaty in London guaranteeing the independence and neutrality of Belgium and the celebrated treaty which Germany was to violate in 1914. Other instances of Louis Philippe's peaceful foreign policy abound. In spite of the urgent demand of many Frenchmen, which they frequently proclaimed by their rioting, he did nothing to help the Poles in their revolt against the Russians or the Italians in their agitation against the Austrians. Twice Tyas, as principal minister, resigned because the king would not let him risk a more adventurous policy. I mean, in 1836, when Thayas wanted to support the liberal side of the Spanish Civil War, and once in 1840, when Francis' ally, Mehmet Ali, was ordered by Britain, Austria, and Russia to restore Syria to Turkey. The second occasion showed so clearly that the bolder Palmerston could humiliate France whenever he chose by relying on Louis Philippe's anxiety to preserve the peace that he resolved was widespread dissatisfaction in France with the king's foreign policy. When Guizot, a conservative, whose views and policies agreed very well with the king's replaced Diaz in 1840, the same foreign policy continued. The French annexed Tahiti until Britain protested. When the annexation was cancelled, in fact up until 1846, the universal charge against the monarch was subservient to Britain, with whom he and Guizot developed a close understanding or entrente to Britain with whom he and Guizot developed a close understanding. In that year, however, Guizot and Louis Felipe carried out their only bold and successful piece of foreign policy apart from the conquest of Algiers, which in any case had been started under Charles X. Both the Queen of Spain, Isabella, and her heir to the throne in I mean, the, the, the Infanta, her sister, was unmarried. There was naturally competition among the powers to supply husbands. Palmerston favored the claims of a German prince, Louis Philippe, a French one. Both agreed to withdraw their claims on condition the other did. Then suddenly Palmerston revived the claim of his candidate. At this, Guizot and Louis Philippe went secretly to work and within a short time astounded Britain by arranging a double marriage of Isabella to an old nobleman 
who was rumored to be important and of Infanta who would thus inherit the throne to a son of Louis Felipe. For once some, someone had stolen a match on Palmerston. But while France rang with applause over the matter and the king's popularity revived a little, Britain smarted and withdrew her friendship. Two years later, she watched the Orleans dynasty dethrone without lifting a finger to save it. Thus, the king's only bold piece of foreign policy had the unfortunate effect of alienating his country's best friends in Europe. Damaging as the foreign policy of Guizot and the king was to the king's reputation, their home policy was even more so. Both were highly intelligent men and Guizot's reputation as an orator, a scholar, and a historian of philosopher stood second to none. Yet both completely failed to realize the need for state action on behalf of France's poor classes. Or for any great measure of political or social progress. At a time when France, in turn undergoing her industrial revolution, was begging to learn the horrors of factory life, slum dwellers and propertyless workers, Guizot could get no further than the fashionable doctrine of Isalais Fair. In his view, the main concern of the government in such matters should be kept outside them. Apart from a law providing elementary education and a factory act, Limiting the employment of children, the 18 years of Louis Philippe's reign saw no real effort to improve the living conditions of, I mean, of the bulk of the people. That some improvements was needed are many to seem from the single fact that nine-tenths of town dwellers examined for the army during the reign were rejected as physically unfit. Only this time, however, the wealthier middle classes the bankers and industrialists were prospering strengthly. Railways were built, while the production of French wine increased twofold, coal fourfold, and machinery tenfold. Thus, the situation was double galling for the workers, who were not only poor, but poor in a period of prosperity. And the only contribution the government seemed to make to the matter was to break up strikes by bloodshed, suppress trade unions and political clubs, and deny the ever-increasing demand for an extension of their right to vote. It was the refusal of this demand which finally brought about the fall of the monarchy. The parliamentary system had never really functioned smoothly under Louis Felipe. The exact extent of the king's power was rather vague and there grew up a feeling that he was exercising more influence than he should. Further, there had not as yet been time for the formation of two highly organized parties like Guizot maintained himself in power by a system of bribery. Government posts, pensions, business contracts, especially in connection with the new railways, were distributed among members of parliament. Guizot was thus supported, I mean, throughout the year in 1840 and 1848 by a parliamentary majority, through, though he was bitterly opposed by most of the country. While the right to vote too was resisted to, I mean, restricted to such a small class, only 200,000 out of 35 million, such a state of affairs could continue indefinitely. So parliamentary reform became the rallying cry of all who were opposed to the conservatism of the king and his minister. Some like theirs probably wanted to extend the franchise slightly to capture power for themselves. Others, like the Republicans, aimed at the vote for all men in order to carry out a complete reform of their social system. In any case, a great campaign for parliamentary reform was begun, and against the slightest concession to he, I mean to the Louis Felipe and Guizot, uh, re, re, resolutely set their faces. 
Guizot's answer, in fact, to those who demand the vote was get rich, then they will qualify for it automatically. By 1846 or 1847, moreover, the dissatisfied in France were able to look for certain positive programs of reform. One of these increasingly attractive alternatives to the stagnation of Louis Felipe was the new doctrine of socialism. Propounded since 1828 by a series of brilliant French writers, socialism claimed by the abolishing private ownership of great industries, banks, transport systems, and the like, and by putting them under the control of the state, all citizens could become more or less equal partners of the wealth of the country and the grotesque inequalities of capitalism will be avoided. One of the former socialists, Louis Blanc, in his book Les Organisés du tra Travail, tried to show how the state could begin to take over the control of industry by running national works and workshops for the benefits of the employ and unemployed. He argued too that the whole unemployment problem will be solved when the state, which will not be concerned merely with profit, act acted as a general employer. His phrase, the right to work, became a demand of the poor classes who naturally saw in socialism not only a means to avoiding the dreaded spells of unemployment but a method of winning for themselves a much fairer and greater share in the wealth of the country. Socialism in various forms thus began to divert the loyalty of the urban working classes away from the Orleans dynasty. Socialism itself underwent a rapid development from 1828 when it was fully an idyllic scheme, such as the proposal that men should work in fields to that sound of grand piano still by 1848, it was becoming an almost scientific doctrine. Not only were there blankest proposals and hundreds of suggestions for really practical undertakings, such as the cutting of the Suez Canal, but in addition, the Germans, I mean the German Marxists and Angels, were maturing the elaborate creed known as the Communism or Revolutionary Socialism. Bonapartism. The second alternative to which the working class could turn was Bonapartism. It may seem difficult to understand the attraction of this, since Napoleon had led the French to disaster. The military triumphs of the empire, however, were of great source of pride to Frenchmen, and the principles of Bonapartism had led entirely reconstructed since 1815. In exile at St. Helena, Napoleon had cleverly edited the history of his career to show that the constant warfare was more or less accidental and caused by other nations and that his dictatorship was not intended, I mean, to, to be temporary. He would, he declared, have given France peace, prosperity and liberal institutions had Europe permitted him to fulfill his life work. These elements in Napoleon's defense of himself were seized in and on, magnified by the heir of the Bonaparte claim, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, a nephew of the emperor. In a series of pamphlets, he proclaimed his care for both the army and for peace and his desire for free institutions. He outlined many schemes of public works and of agricultural and commercial reform, all designed to abolish unemployment and bring prosperity. Though he twice failed ridiculously in attempts to seize power, the cult of Bonapartism gradually developed. An important at the beginning of Louis Felipe's reign, it became gradual more and more of a menace as industrial distress grew and the government still did nothing. As shaped by Louis Napoleon, it appeared to the neglected working classes to the slightest army 
to all those who disliked Louis Philippe's cautions foreign policy and even agitated of something of its sting. Diaz and Luis Felipe completed the Arc de Triomphe in celebration of their victorious, I mean of the victories of the empire, opened a museum of conquests at Versailles, and had the emperor's remains brought from St. Helena to be interred in Paris. The maneuver was unsuccessful. They hoped to satisfy the Napoleonic clamor by a little cheap pageantry. But, in fact, they only caused men all the more to contract, I mean all the more, to contract, to contrast the colorful days of the empire with a drab existence of the present reign. The contrast was heightened by the work of a number of skilled Frenchmen historians such as Lamartine and Blanc, who in their treatment of the revolutionary period depicted the leaders of that generation as gigantic figures who completely dwarfed Louis Felipe and Gurizot. By 1847, when an economic crisis was adding to other troubles, the government thus had a few enthusiastic supporters. It had done almost nothing for the workers. It was corrupt. It had knuckled under to Britain. Its very real services in keeping the peace for 18 years and thereby allowing industry and commerce to develop were not generally appreciated. Either socialism or Bonapartism promised more. Father France, as Lamartine put it, was simply bored with the existing regime. It was all too callous and stagnant. The fat old king often drawn by the caricaturist in the shape of a William Spe Shakespeare, I mean William Spear, became a figure of ridicule. His middle class taste shown in the new apartments of Versailles seemed utterly unattractive when compared in the same building with the splendor of Louis or the brilliant vulgarity of Napoleon. Above all, the Ministry of Gui Resort and Astrere Wayapula in eight years of power had virtually barred all progress. As Lamartine, the Republican poet and historian said, if that were all the genius required for a statesman charged with the direction of affairs, there will be no need for statesmen. A milestone will do just as well. To many, it became clear that the first step to progress was to shift the milestone ministry to Gui Resorts. Government was rapidly nicknamed. To accomplish a real change in the direction of the government, however, it was necessary to extend the franchise for the existing class of wealthy, I mean, uh, electors, was quite satisfied with Gui Resort. The agitation for parliamentary reform grew space. There was not so much a desire to uproot the monarchy as to make the government more democratic and more aware of industrial and social problems. The full result in 1848 revolution like that of 1830, though everything had been leading up to it, was something of an accident. The opposition started a big series of reform banquets. At these opposition orators will speak on the need for giving more people the vote. Gradually, they advanced from a request for modified electoral reform to omission of the king's name from the toast list and a demand for a republic with a vote for everybody. In February 1848, a great reform banquet was announced. With a reform, I mean a process. Scientists uh, scenting danger, the government banned the banquet. A number of uh, complicated moves followed and the organizers finally decided to call off the procession. Half the banquet did not know whether the whole affair 
was really on or off. But by this time, the Paris masses had got it into their heads that something exciting will happen anyway, and so turned up for the procession in force. Then that government made the fatal mistake of calling out the National Guard to disperse the crowd. Fatal because the Guard showed their sympathy with the crowd and so encouraged it. A more ruthless man than Louis Philippe will have ordered out the regular troops to fire on the Guard and perhaps quelled the whole matter by a brutal display of force. Louis Philippe, old and peaceful, refused to face the prospect of blood and consented to dismiss Guizot. The next day, an accidental clash between a small section of the crowd and some troops led to the barricades going up all over Paris again and working classes prepared to resist the troops by force. In the fighting which ensued, the troops put no heart into the work. And when the king reviewed them, instead of Vai or Vive Leroy, he got shouts of Vive la Reforme. Discouraged at the collapse of all his work murmuring, this is worse than Charles X, the old king, lost heart for the first time and abdicated in favor of his grandson, the Count of Paris. But as it turned out, the Orleans monarchy, mourned by very few, was at an end. A provisional government was formed in Parliament and France became a republic for the second time in her history. The Tullias, meanwhile, had been looted by the mob, some of whom were drowned in the floods of wine released from their royal cellars. The Second French Republic and the Second French Empire The social, I mean the Second Republic in 1848 to 1852. When Louis Philippe abdicated, he had no intention of ending the monarchy. The more determined of the revolutionaries, however, were eager to, I mean, for a republic and got one. Yet they were not of a united body. Some of them were intellectuals of the middle or upper classes who were members of the assembly. Like the poet and historian Lamartine, well read in history, they desired a republicly larger for sentimental reasons such as admiration for the old Roman Republic or for the Second French Republic. But others were men of the working classes or else middle class champions of the working class. Like the historian Louis Blanc who wanted a republic had the best means of achieving socialist measures and a higher standard of living for the poor. These republicans of diverse views were able to seize control by acting together. But they did not, of course, represent the whole of the nation. Equally important, if not more so, were the people who for the moment were only in the background, the peasantry and small landowners of France. Having made considerable gain in 1789, these were soon to show themselves deeply suspicious of further revolutions and republics made in Paris. Conservative by instinct, they were anxious above all for a regime which would guarantee law, order, and the security of their property. On the abdication of Louis Philippe in February 1848, Lamartine was one of those who took the lead. When Amor burst into the chamber of deputies to demand the end of the Orleans dynasty and the setting up of a republic, he persuaded them to agree to the formation of a provisional government consisting largely of a republican dep dep deputies. To this list of names, the working class groups who had meanwhile seized control of the Paris municipal government compelled him to add some of their own nominees, including the socialist Louis Blanc. At the same time, a republic was declared. The provisional government had thus formed then arranged to elect, and I mean for elections to be held in April, in to a, a return a new assembly which will settle the details of the republican consultation. 
For these elections, the vote was granted to all adult males, whenever they could read or not, and France's electorate suddenly leapt, leapt from 250,000 to 9 million. The result of the election was the most of the seats were going or went to moderate Republicans, a fair-sized minority to declare royalists, and only a very few to the socialist extremists. Whatever the feeling in Paris, France itself seemed to be a fairly conservative country. The Paris working classes, however, could not be ignored. Since February, they had been armed and they were determined not to let their efforts merely serve the interests of the middle classes as had happened in 1830. They were driven too by real need, for the 1840s were hard times with much unemployed. Twice in March, extremist groups rioted without success and in May, a throng of extremists invaded them mentor and momentarily took over the assembly, for which they were expelled only by the arrival of the National Guard. Frustrated in the attempts of their more violent leaders to seize direct control, the Paris working classes had to pin their hopes on blank, some of whose ideas the provisional government had promised to put into effect. Blanc had long advocated social workshops or cooperatives where the workers would pool their efforts for the common good. This, he thought, could be the first steps towards socialism, I mean socializing all the vital elements in the nation's economic life. At the same time, they would help to absorb some of the many unemployed. Blanc was a member, however, of a government which was by no means socialist and which, therefore, tried to limit the application of his ideas. The result was that though national workshops to the, I mean, uh, absorb the unemployed went, I mean, were set up in response to popular clamor, they were nothing like the workshops of Blanc's ideas. They were not cooperatives, and the work offered was almost entirely of the laboring order, replanting trees, paving roads, building railway stations at a rate of two francs a day. Nevertheless, in the harsh conditions of 1848, the unemployed and even many of the employed flocked to these national works. The results were unfortunate. In the first place, the government, unimaginatively in supplying work and frightened of offending wealthy manufacturers by setting up in competition with them, began to order the same tasks to be done over again to employ all the applicants. As this got more absurd, greater and greater numbers were placed on inactivity, pay of one franc a day. Taxation began to mount to pay for all this and a financial crisis occurred. The interests of the tax-paying middle classes and the propertyless working classes were now seen to be sharply opposed, and the newly assembly consisting almost entirely of the former demanded an end to the workshops. To close them without breaking too many promises, the government offered the workers and idlers who attended them the choice of joining the army if young or clearing land in the provinces. This offer was summed up by one French historian as a choice between being shot by the Arabs in Algeria or dying of fever in the swamps of Ceylon. Faced with this action on the part of the government in June 1848, the armed workers on Paris rose in a French, I mean, a French revolution. Up went the barricades, over went buses and locomotives to strengthen them. The Paris working classes fought bravely in this struggle against the government, but they were opposed to the army, the National Guard, the upper and middle classes, and the whole of the provinces. Heavy artillery was used to smash the resisting streets, and the blood over 10, 000, of over 10,000 French men flowed before the revolt was crushed. After the struggle was over, thousands more were deported. It was a dreadful experience and it gravely weakened the social Second Republic. Henceforth, the working classes will never feel confident in its good intentions and the middle classes will never feel confident in its ability. 
A few months later, in October, the new Republican constitution was completed. Power was to be split between a president and an assembly, both elected by universal suffrage. The question of who was to be president had still be, be, to be settled. The three main candidates were General Kavinak, the minister of war who had just put down the Paris revolutionaries. Lamartine and Charles Louis, Napoleon Bonaparte's nephew of the great empire. The son of the emperor's brother Louis, who from 1806 to 1810 was king of Holland, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte had lived adventurously. A romantic believing, I mean family, in his destiny as his uncle's heir, he had been involved in the bewildering variety of scripts, revolutions, and love affairs. In 1831, he had joined the Italian secret society, the Carbonari, in their revolt against papal rule in Rome, and had eventually escaped from the Austrians disguised as a footsman. Exiled from France, he wrote books on military subjects to make himself popular with the French army and on social subjects to show his care for the French people. In 1836, with a few followers, he had tried to invade France, raise the garrison of Astrabag, and claim the throne from Louis Philippe. But he had shrunk from using violence, had failed even to make a good speech to the soldiers, and had let the whole affair, I mean, degenerate into a scaffold. This was followed by his arrest and deportation to the United States. Undeterred by the miserable failure, he continued to press his claim, and in exile in Switzerland and England, he wrote a book, Des Idil Napoleon Ides Tokiti, in which ideas of peace, socialism, and Bonapartism were intermingled. In 1840, thinking the time ripe for a further attempt, he landed at Ballon with about 50 men and a captive vulture to represent the imperial eagle. Again, the invasion developed into the indignified scaffold. Louis Napoleon tried to escape by swimming out of a boat, but it capsized. He was wounded and captured, and in a few hours was once more the laughing stock of France. At his trial, however, he confirmed his anger in power had never been revoked by the French people, and that, therefore, a Bonaparte should still be ruling. The lenient government of, of Louis Philippe, anxious not to make a matter of him, ordered him to be confined for life in the fortress of Ham and his ego in the zoological gardens. He was taken to Ham on the very day and that the ashes of his famous uncle brought back from St. Helena were interred in the invalids. At home, under very free conditions which allowed him to study and to keep a mistress, Louis Napoleon had even devoted further attention to social problems. He soon produced schemes for the development of the French beet sugar industry, for improving army recruitment, for a Panam, I mean Panama Canal, and for doing away with poverty by making the state take over the and develop all unoccupied land. His books, La Extinction du Pour Paris, appeared in 1840, that he grew popular with the French working classes and became regarded as a man of vision. In 1846, having declared that the time was ripe for his escape, he damaged his rooms so badly that they needed repairs, and in the course of this disguise, he disguised himself as a waxman and walked out of the fortress with a plank over his shoulder. Safe in London again, Louis Napoleon showed his love of humanity by his attention to the ballet girls. When the revolutionary of February 1848 overthrew Louis Philippe, he quickly returned to France and offered his services, only to be asked to leave. Back in London once more, 
He helped the forces of law and order by enrolling as a special constable during the chariots, I mean chariots riots. Then the law again. The Bonapartes was repealed in France for the benefit of Louis Napoleon's cousin, not himself, and to return to Paris. Securing election to the assembly, he made such a poor impression that his opponents did not rate him seriously in his ambition to become president. Dias, in fact, even began to encourage his candidature on the ground that he was a noodle who anyone could twist around his finger. But they miscalculated badly. The name Napoleon offered to the middle classes a guarantee of law and order, while the books which Louis himself had written promised a host of useful social reforms acceptable to the working classes. In all his propaganda, Louis Napoleon kept the military dictatorship of Napoleon I in the background and stressed only the great emperor's reform and liberal intentions. So it came about that, on a national vote in December 1848, Louis Napoleon was elected president of the French Republic with 5,400,000 votes, while Calvariac received 1,400,000 and poor Lamartin only 17,000. The term of office of the prince pre president as he was for years, he immediately set out to combine enjoyment with popularity. He especially courted the army, the church, big business, and the broad mass of the people. When a new assembly of a fairly Catholic and conservative I mean, character was elected in 1848, he cooperated with it in some matters, for example, in the Louis Fallox, which allowed their religious orders and other private groups to set up schools, but he opposed in all the others. One measure in particular which the assembly had passed with his approval, he later strove to undo in 1850, alarmed at the fact that the vote had been given to so many who were as yet unable to read or write. The assembly disqualified three million casual laborers from voting by a law which stated that they must have resided continuously for three years in the same district. Louis Napoleon later decided to champion the cause of these men, and this combined with his plans outlined in 1854 railways, roads, harbors, canals, moral farming, drainage, and sanitation increased his popularity with the poorer classes. Louis Napoleon's period of office was due to expire in 1852, and there was a law against re-election. His attempt to have this repeal having failed, he began planning an extension of his power by other means. He was powered partly by ambition, partly by the fact that he was deeply in debt and could not afford to lose his presidential income. At the same time, some of the leaders of the assembly began plotting to get rid of him as prince president, for he was already beginning to act very like a dictator. Dias, for example, openly boasted before a month up, we will have Louis Bonaparte under lock and key. It was the prince president who struck first. At 10 p.m. on the night of the 2nd December 1851, the anniversary of Australitz following usual evening reception, a brilliantly engineered coup d'etat began. 78 separate police officers during the night arrested 70 eight separate leaders of the opposition, both police and prisoners being quite ignorant of the fact that they were part of a large-scale operation. Troops were posted in strategic positions and print, I mean printers were forced to print proclamations announcing the change in the presidential position. Paris woke up to find Louis Napoleon supreme over his opponents. The Matanich period in the Austrian Empire and the German Confederation. From the Congress of Vienna to the outbreak of revolution, 1815 to 1848. 
From the end of the Napoleonic Wars to the revolutionary movements of 1848, the history of Germany and Austria was influenced to a remarkable degree by one man, Prince Metternich. Few statesmen have had to face so series of problems and few have received so much blame for their attempted solutions. In some respects, he was and still is a great misjudged man. In any case, for more than a generation, he occupied a unique position, not only as foreign minister of the Austrian Empire, but also as embodiment of the old European, of the monarch in which, I mean monarchies, which was fighting a desperate battle with the new European and revolutionary ideals. To understand Matanich's preeminence, remember that it was he, more than anyone else within four years, his appointment as foreign minister in 1809 successfully maneuvered Austria away from her temporary alliance with Napoleon and brought her in with allies. It was his skill in 1814 which inspired the manifesto of the allies invading France to the effect of their quarrel with Napoleon, not the French. I know, Matanich, only he could have thought of that, exclaimed Napoleon. It was he too whose spirit was so active to, at the Congress of Vienna and whose diplomacy was so successful in bringing the famous final act or summary of the arrangements rapidly to completion when Napoleon escaped from Elba, a financial act of 121 articles which took 26 secretaries all day to write all a single copy. Above all, it was he who with Castrilliac was the inspirer of the Congress movement, the movement to establish a concrete, a concert of Europe or the word of contemporary to put all heads under the same thinking cup. The ideals of this man born the son of a count and later created a prince and educated from the first for an assigned position in the imperial court, he became fixed. He had spent all his public life thus far in striving to protect Austria from Napoleon, who claimed to represent certain ideals associated with the French Revolution. As a young man, he had witnessed the excesses of a French revolutionary mob in Strasbourg, and later he had seen the intense nationalism of France bringing untold misery to Europe. He was an enthusiastic traveler, a student, and a patron of art and science. The boundaries of which are far from being national. He was the foreign minister of 18 to 21, dignified with the title of counselor of an empire which included 13 races and many religions. It was his habit, he said, to write in Paris, I mean to Paris in French, to London in English, to St. Petersburg in Russian, and to Berlin in German. In a word, his outlook was that of a cosmopolitan aristocrat of the 18th century. It was an outlook which in its culture, its love of peace, and its opposition to anything which marked the vulgarity of the rabble, such as disorder agitated the nationalists' hysteria, had much to commend it. Unfortunately, it was also an outlook which ignored the need for development. It was because Matanich represented so completely and so ably the views of the European aristocracy generally that he occupied such an outstanding position in the generation after Waterloo. Apart from his prime duty of safeguarding Austria's interest, he saw his tax acts twofold, to preserve the European peace and to maintain for monarchy and aristocracy their privileged position against the assaults of the growing forces of the age, liberalism and nationalism. In all these objects, he met a fair degree of success. Although the Congress system collapsed by 1829, no major European war occurred from 1815 till the Crimean War in 1854, and no liberal or national outbreak really shook the Austrians Empire till 1848. Even then the revolutionary movement was suppressed within a year or so and it was not until 1859 that in the loss of Lombardy the disembarkment of the empire began. 
At the same time, it is apparent from the vagrant point of the 20th century that in the struggle against what was for the most part extreme inefficient monarchy, the liberal and national forces were almost bound to win. It has required the technical resources of and ruthless efficiency of modern dictatorship of the left or right to the liberal movement. Martinich himself was something accurately conscious of the fact that his task was almost helpless. I have to give my life to propping up a smoldering edifice, he once remarked in a moment of pessimism. The Emperor Francis referring to the claims of the different nationalities within his empire put the matter even more strongly. My realm is like a warm eaten house. If one part is removed, one cannot tell how much will fall. Let us see how Martinich strove to act. In his words, as a rock of order in Austria and Germany. The Allies of 1813 in the War of uh, Liberalization had taken advantage of the patriotic stirrings in Germany aroused by the continental system and the oppressive demands of Napoleon. As Napoleon had appeared or appealed to the forces of local or national patriotism in the early days of his victories, so the Allies had later been able to use the same weapon against him with considerable effect. Napoleon himself, with his usual acuteness, prophesied that the Allies would pay for the encouragement of nationalism when it turned against their own empires. However, the arrangements of peace settlement of 1814 to 1815 in regard to Germany and Austria Empire, not less than elsewhere, show how little importance the Allies as yet attacked the national principles. What they were mainly concerned with in Vienna and other treaties was how to restore the older rulers, reward themselves and restrain the aggressive nationalism of France. In so doing, of course, their great hope was to achieve a stable and not a changing Europe. The Austrian Empire, as recognized by the treaties of 1815, included as its main section Austria proper, which by origin and population was German, Bohemia, and Moravia, inhabited chiefly by Zech, Slo Slovaks, and Germans. Hungary, that is migrant, and many minorities, notably Serb and Croatia. Galicia, mainly Ruthenians and Poles, acquired during the partition of Poland. Transylvania, that is Romans uh, of Latin origin. Illyria and Dalmatia, Serbs and Croatians and Lombardy and the, I mean, the, the Venetia, that is Italians. It thus contained, besides oddities like the Magaians representatives of the so-called Revolution of Europe, the Teuton, that is the Germans, the Slavs, that is the Zechs, the Croatians, the Poles and the Serbs, and the Latin, the Romans act as yet, with the exception of some of the Italians and possibly some of the Germans of Austria itself, the new wine of nationalism and democracy had not yet reached the heads or even the lips of most of these peoples. And so the central government in Vienna was not in immediate danger of being challenged. This was all the more so since the government of Vienna permitted a wide variety of local difference, employed a local officials rather than bureaucrats from Vienna, and generally allowed a very considerable degree of liberty, provided that no political agitation of any kind took place. Hungary enjoyed a separate parliament, or diet, in which an intensely feudal nobility frequently asserted their privileges against Vienna. It was further no part of the policy of Metternich to attempt to Germanize and Australianize the whole of the empire. He was not keen enough on a nationalism to enforce his own particular brand of it, while he correspondingly denied the right of the other brands to break away from the international empire. The government of Vienna, however, while well-meaning and not unduly tyrannical, was for the most part inefficient. It was badly in need of reorganization and Metternich made several efforts to induce his imperial master to accept schemes of reform. 
Purely internal matters, however, were the subject on which he possessed least influence, for his role above all was the foreign, or uh, I mean, of that of foreign minister. I have sometimes ruled Europe, he once remarked, but I have never governed Austria. In the matter of race, Germany presented a very different picture from the Austrian Empire. It was inhabited solidly by Germans. Politically, however, it had even less unity. Before the Napoleonic Wars, some eight or nine large cities, including Prussia, Bravia, and Saxony, and over 300 smaller ones had existed, all forming part of the Holy Roman Empire and acknowledging the authority in name, though very little in fact of the emperor to which position the Habsburg ruler of Austria had for centuries been elected. Napoleon's campaigns in Germany, however, had broken down many of the old divisions and finished off the shadowy Holy Roman Empire. Napoleon had also created some new and more powerful units, such as the Confederation of the Rhine. While this a great deal of administrative reform, he, I mean, had been carried out, the large sections of Germany had been released from medieval restrictions for the first time. The peacemakers of Vienna naturally allow no place to such Napoleonic creations. They had collapsed anyway. With the breakdown of Napoleon power and consequently a fresh settlement was necessary in 1814 to 1815. The Congress of Vienna made no attempt to revive the defunct Holy Roman Empire. The Habsburg Emperor himself readily consented to the abandonment, abandonment of the title whose history had begun with, a, I mean, Charlie Magni in 1800 AD. Because Austria had set herself the task of consolidating a really strong Austrian empire formed around the great natural economic link of the Danube. At the same time, she was not prepared to see the growth of a power northern rivalry to take over her whole as a leader of Germany, and this fact taken together with the claims of the various royal houses of Germany made it certain that there would be no strong German state created. The hundreds of states had now, by the force of circumstances, been boiled down to a mere 39, and the confederation into which these were formed were deliberately kept as weak as possible. His diet consisted purely of abandonments of the various states not representatives elected by the peoples. Its members undertook not to declare war on one another and to provide protection if attacked, but no law was binding on any member state unless that particular state approved of the law in question. This alone with the fact that unanimity was necessary for any change in the constitution made the confederation almost powerless. The monarchs of Austria, and on account of her German lands, Britain on account of Hanover, Denmark on account of Holstein, and Holland on account of Luxembourg, were all represented in the Diet, and none of these had any interest in the development of a strong Germany. The weakness of the confederation disappointed those Germans who had hoped for a greater measure of national union, but it was not surprising. There was in fact no agreement on any particular form of closer union, and the powerful forces of local patriotism were all against any effective central government. However, though the confederation was left weak, its members were enjoined by the Vienna Act to grant constitutions to their subjects. Germany might thus perhaps look forward to a period of increasing liberalism, though not to one of the increasing German unity. This hope proved false. Only four or five rulers carried out their promise to grant a constitution, and none of these constitutions went very far in the direction of the popular rights. The natural consequence was an outbreak of liberal agitation, particularly among the numerous university students and their professors. Often this found a center in the newly formed student patriotic organizations, that is the Bruce Chen Schaffien, which had sprung up in 16 of the German universities. 
In 1817 in Saxony, there occurred the Warburg Festival, a meeting of the Brucian Schaffien to celebrate the fourth anniversary of the Battle of Leipzig and the tension tari of Martin Luther protests against purple indulgences. The intention was also to form a closer union among German university students. The students marked the occasion by banning a number of selected guys, some books and periodicals, the views of which they resented, and a few emblems of Prussian militarism which was disliked both for itself and for having adopted French fashions. These emblems included a corporal's cane, a pig's tail as worn by the infantry, and a pair of corsets as spotted by the cavalry. It was only a student a demonstration, but its spirit was unmistakable. The Metrinich took good notice of it. The more so nice he suspected the Tsra Alexander, who from 1815 had been under the influence of liberalism for fomenting similar troubles throughout Europe. Two years later, a much more sensational student act occurred, the murder of Kotzebue, he was an unpopular author of reactionary reviews and a spy of Russia, Pei, who was regarded as poisoning the mind of Alexander against liberalism. Round about the same time, another student attempted to assassinate a leading minister in one of the German states. At once, Metrinich seized his opportunity. He won over Alexander so completely from the last of his liberalism that in 1820 the Tsar said to him, Today, I deplore all that I said and did between 1815 and 1818. I regret the time lost. We must study to retrieve it. You have correctly judged the conditions of things. Tell me what you want and what you want of me and I will do it. It was a remarkable admission. But then, as Metrinich said, Alexander's mind never could pursue one line of vote for long. More important still, he used the occasion to secure the endorsement of the Diet of the Confederation of a series of laws designed to crush all political agitation. This originally drawn up in, uh, I mean, Kalbrad at the Conference of Nine of the leading states called the Metrinich work known as the Calabards decrees. By them, a strict censorship was uh, elsewhere set up. Investigators of uh, recent activities were appointed. Student societies were suppressed. Political meetings were forbidden. Professors were dismissed. Liberal leaders sentenced to years of imprisonment. The result was the Metrinich a triumph. Liberalism in Germany and Austria was crippled for nearly a generation to come. The German race hampered in its effort as political expression had to find full scope of its genius in such a strictly non-political subjects or scientific music. The stronghold which Metronich thus helped to secure was remarkably complete. Though the fall of the Bourbons in France in 1830 produced repercussions all over Europe, including uh, revolutions in Belgium, Poland, and Rome. The Austrian Empire and German remained free from any reason, really serious disturbance. In Germany, indeed, there was agitation, and the inhabitants of four states succeeded in wringing constitutions from their rulers. But that was all. By 1833, it was clear that the rulers, however, were once more on top. In fact, from the Karlsbad decree till the revolutionary retiring of 1847 to 1849, there was no political event of significance for the future of Germany, liberalism or nationalism. There was, however, a movement of a mainly economic character which was destined to have very great results. In 1816, Prussia had abolished a vexatious remnant of medieval 
a medieval medievalism which she repealed all her internal customs duties and made the transit of goods from the one district of Prussia to another quite custom free two years later she instituted a common tariff for her whole kingdom as against the goods of other states it was very low or non-existent in raw materials and only about 10% on top manufacturers. She also invited neighboring states to join his large customs area, and those small states which were completely surrounded by Prussia's territory quickly saw the advantage of doing so. From about 1828, this invitation was made a little more pressing by putting very heavy tariffs of the, on the goods of external neighbors who did not accept it. This Prussian custom union quickly showed remarkable signs of success, so much so that it was resented by other German states, which formed opposition groups including a Southwest Union of Bavaria and Wartemberg and a Middle Union, I mean, and a Middle Union, a Middle Union covering Hanover, Hessel, Kassel, and other states. The opposition groups, however, found themselves gradually forced by economic pressure to come to terms with the Prussian one, so that by 1829 the association centering upon Brevia had signed a treaty in the middle association was, and the middle association was beginning to break up with them, its members coming in one by one. In 1833, the Southern Union finally joined the enlarged Prussian one, and with the addition the same year, the Saxony and the Dargarian states, the scheme was set to proclaim us from 1st January 1834. The existence of the German customs and a commercial union, usually known as the Zulverein, in the ensuing years helped by the building of the first German railways. This union prospered and tr attracted other German states so that by 1844, the Zulverein covered nearly all Germany. Hanover and Hasburg were perhaps the most important exceptions. Though Germany in 1840 still lacked the effectiveness political union, it was thus on the way to economic union, and the importance of this fact must not be overlooked. Moreover, through the Zulverein Prussia rather than Austria was uh, taking the lead in Germany, the economic advancement by this time, especially in Prussia, was not confined to getting rid of customs barriers. New roads had been built, a modern postal system initiated, railways constructed, steam power introduced, while side by side with these great developments in education such as the founding of polytechnics, schools, gymnasia were apparent. After a period during which Prussia had seemed to lose all desire to follow the tradition of her great reformers in 1806 period, Steiner Handenberg and as char host, she began to revert to her policy of equipping herself as a really modern state. In this, the main guiding force were, I mean, was a devoted and efficient civil service. The change on the throne of Austria and Prussia during these years were matters of importance. In 1835, the Emperor Francis, steadily conservative, far from being brilliant, but trusting impli implicitly on Metternich, died. He was succeeded by Ferdinand described by Palmer Stone in his usual round terms as the next thing to the, an idiot. Thenceforward, Metronich's advice was not always followed, and from about 1840 on he, on he had to intrigue to keep his position to court. The presence of an opposite party to the councillors at court encouraged liberalism in Austria, so hope once more. The Prussia too, the greatly respected old man Frederick William III, like Metternich and Francis, a survival from Napoleonic days also died and was succeeded in 1840 by Frederick William VI. Sorry, Frederick William IV. The character of the new king, 
who was known to be religious, humane, and anxious to avoid all forms of persecution, caused a great revival of the partly neglected moves of constitutionalism and a greater degree of national union. The composition in a 1844 example of the famous patriotic song Die Watch am Rhein, that is the watch on the Rhine, showed which way sentiment was moving. The appointment of well-known patriots and even liberals as the principal Prussian ministers together with the relaxation of the censorship seemed to confirm Prussians in the opinion that their king was indeed of progressive outlook. Unfortunately, however, it is difficult for a king or pope to be liberally or democratically inclined when the increased demands resulting from his encouragement begin to outrun what he himself desires. Frederick, who was in truth not liberal at all, but a religious autocrat with human sympathies, rapidly found himself in this position. He soon ended in the experiment of a milder censorship milder censorship. He did, however, do something towards the establishment of the constitution which F Frederick William III had promised Prussia as far back as 1815. He permitted a parliament or diet to meet for all Prussians, uh, Prussia in 1847. It consisted of the deputies from the local and rather powerless diets of the separate uh, Prussian provinces. As it was not directly elected, however, and as Frederick William refused to allow regular meetings or anything more than a mere debating right, it was a little use of little use of to enthusiastic liberals. In fact, the idea of a written constitution which would truly limit his power deeply shocked him, for he had a strong conception of the divine right of his position. Never will I consent, he said, that a written paper should intrude like a second province between our Lord God in heaven and this country to govern us through its paragraphs. The demand for more representative forms of government in both Austria and Germany, however, was soon to enter a new phase. In Germany, the failure of the potato crop in 1846, the double the prize of wheat in 1847, the thousands dying of hunger, typhus, had all reacted powerfully on the various state governments. These factors were partly responsible for Frederick William's decision to call a, I mean, to a, uh, to call uh, a Prussian parliament. All over Europe, economic distress was giving an extra spur to political agitation. The first big instance of actual rebellion came in 1846 unsuccessfully from discontented popes in the last piece of semi-independent Polish territory, the free city of Krakow in Galicia. For help against the rebels in the city, authorities turned in the, uh, to the Austrians who soon took advantage of the situation to incorporate the territory into the Austrian Empire. Then in 1847, the more democratic cantons of Switzerland took action against the Skobdun, that is a separate league of the seven Catholic and more conservative cantons formed in 1845 under Austrian patronage and broke it up. In January 1848, there were risings in Sicily, followed the next month by outbreaks on the land of Italy. Finally, on 27th February 1848, the Orleans monarchy of Louis Philippe fell in France. Like fireworks touched off one from another, liberal revolutions then erupted throughout Europe and not less in Austrian Germany. The revolutionary movements in the Austrian Empire in 1848 to 1851. The revolutions of 1848 were remarkable for their dramatic suddenness. The news of the fall of the Orleans monarchy reached Vienna in the first March by the 13th March. Many teach the statesman of 40 years' experience was filling from the capital with a forged passport like a criminal and rulers were making frantic secessions all over Germany to save their tottering thrones. The revolutions in Germany were profoundly affected by the revolutions in Austria. 
and for the sake of clarity it may be well to follow first the revolutionary movements in the Austrian Empire. The part of the Austrian Empire which enjoyed the greatest opportunity for the expression of national feeling was Hungary. Here a separate diet had long existed, in which the proud Magyar nobility frequently strove to assert independent claims against Austria. At the same time, Hungary itself, like most of the Austrian empires, were in an intense backward state, with the nobility still preserving medieval feudal privileges over the peace country and enjoying a completely exemption from taxation. Already in Hungary, led by the fiery young lawyer journalist Louis Kossuth, a movement to introduce liberal reforms had arisen. Kosuth's first demand was that the debates of the Diet should be held in Magyar, not Latin. He also insisted, contrary to government regulations, on circulations and reports of the debates held in the Diet and in the local assemblies. In his efforts to outwit the police and the law, he was in I mean, he, re he was reduced to having his pamphlets lithographed instead of printed and then finally to having them copied out by hand. Not surprisingly, imprisonment followed, but on the, his release after three years, he continued to campaign with heroic determination. In 1844, he had helped to force the Austrians into recognizing that Magyar should be the language, not only the Hungarian diet. But of law, government business and public education throughout Hungary, in 1847, Kosuth, despite his lack of landed property, was elected as member for. Though the Magyar nobility disapproved of most of his ideas, nearly all could accept his championing of Hungary as against Austria. Immediately after hearing the news of the 1848 revolution in France, Sensing that the honor of radical change had struck, Kossuth on March that came out with a flaming speech in the Hungarian diet. From the channel house of the Venice system, he said, A postilistio breath steals over us which paralyzes our nerves and deadens our national spirit. He demanded not only that Hungary should be equal to in Australia, in Austria, in, uh, I mean, to Austria in all respects, enjoying a separate Hungarian ministry, but that serfdom and the nobles' privileges should be abolished and a constitutional system established with liberty of the press, of meeting, and of association. Support of Kosuth's policy was not lack from the ordinary citizen of Budapest who succeeded in making their own noble accept a people's character. In March and April 1848, a series of laws that the March and April laws were carried out through the Hungarian Diet at Pressburg, that is Bratislava, establishing the main reforms demanded by Kosuth and setting up a new parliament at Budapest. This was to be elected on the basis of a property qualification and Magyar speech and it was to cover all the lands to which Hungary traditionally laid claim, including those like Transvenia and Croatia, where the Romans and the Croats respectfully, regretfully outnumbered the Magyars. The Romans and the Croats respectively outnumbered the Magyars, and it now remained for the victorious Magyar nationalities to wring approval of their arrangements from the Austrian government. Meanwhile, in Vienna, too, events had moved in a revolutionary direction, taking their cue from the France, which uh, from Hungary, I mean, a number of students and uh, professors held a great demonstration on 12 March. The mob cheerfully extended this uh, the following day into fighting and an invasion of the palace and uh, secured important promises from the paralyzed and inefficient government. The outcry naturally included yells of down with Metronich, down with Metronich, and the government had no better policy than the sacrifice the aged councillor to the storm, 
When it called the troops into Vienna, they only fraternized with the, the rabble, to use Metternich's expression. On 15th March, the government promised a constitution in the formal, in form of a national guard, and when on 17th March had to accept the Hungarian demand for a separate ministry, responsible for, to the Hungarian diet alone. During the following month, the imperial government worked out on the details of the promised constitutions, which proved to be a very restricted one and conceded on the main demands put forward from Budapest. These events were rapidly paralleled in other sections of the empire. Before much was out local, uh, revolts had driven the Austrians out of Milan and Venice, where a republic was set up under Daniel Manin. And the king of Sardinia they declared, uh, declared, had declared a war with the intention of expelling them from the entire Italian peninsula. At a gram in Croatia, the Croats demanded the restoration of the ancient rights, while at Prague, capital of Bohemia, the Zeches framed the constitutional demands similar to those of Hungarians. To all these, the Czech and imperial government agreed. Only in Italy, where war was decided, there was deciding the deciding issue, and in Galicia, where the energetic Austrian government, that is, Count Stadion, kept the Poles to check, did it attempt any real resistance. The salvation of the Austrian monarchy, however, soon came in spite of itself. In May, it touched its lowest depths when, after a feeble effort to oppose further demands by Vienna radicals, the emperor and his family suddenly left Vienna for, I mean, Inbrusk, on the frontier. At the beginning of June 2, a great congress, a great congress of the different branches, of the Slavs race opened in Prague to discuss possible ways uh, of organizing their racial kinship. A movement which spelled danger to an emperor, of which the ruler was not by race Slovenic, but just when things seemed in their worst of the empire and the tide began to turn. From Italy came news of the first success of the Austrian commander, that is Radeschetzi. In Prague itself, the Austrian governor Prince Windischazidis found himself confronted by the crowd of Zeche's radicals, largely students agitating for Bohemia's independence. He resisted the demand of the mob for ornament, armaments, and after a struggle in which his palace was attacked and his wife shot dead at a window, he withdrew with his troops, and he withdrew with his troops from the city. Bombarded in it all night, and by morning had completely subdued the rebels. The uh, separatist zeches of Bohemia had failed, and one part of the empire, at least, was saved. The solution of the rest of the difficulty for the imperial government was to come from the very fact which had caused most of the trouble. The existence of such a welter of difference, I mean different nationalities within the empire. The point to bear in mind is that not only was the empire so composed, but they, each province within the empire was practically a smaller edition of the empire in its varying races. The Croats and Romans under Hungarian government now found, for example, that the rule of the dominant Magyans in Hungary was rather less to their taste than that of their previous and more distant masters, the Austrians. When they claimed from the Hungarians the same liberty as the Hungarians claimed from the Austrians, they were denied it. Before long, the Croats under their beloved uh, leader, Count Je Je that is Je Je Jelakik, who hated the Magyans and who was a loyal servant of the emperor, were in conflict with Hungary. They trusted Jelakik's optimism, views that loyalty to the House of Austria would ally, I mean, earn them more concessions than revolt. It was the obvious, I mean, it was the obvious, if unsavory policy of the imperial government to accentuate 
these national jobless jealous, jealousies and then watch its various enemies rend each other in pieces. Fresh hope gleamed for the monarchy. The more so since uh, Radeskitsi had in July won a great victory over the Sardinian forces at Custoza and was soon to re-enter Milan. We continue. Spurred by the success of the, stra of the, of the, of the stung to action by Kosu, the extreme financial measures which were budgeting uh, for Hungary as a separate state, the Austrian government now definitely urged uh, Jelasik and his Croats to attack the new authorities in Hungary. He did so in September for a while Amina was held in check for part of his army had to surrender. But Ayus was soon found for his troops. When another and more violent democratic outbreak occurred in Vienna itself, the government called on Jelasik to advance there and at the same time summoned help from Windis Chesrag in Prague. So in October, Windis Chesrag arrived uh, to bombard Vienna into submission as he had done in Prague, while Jelasik defeated a force at Hung uh, of Hungarians sent by Kosuth to the rescue of the Venice Democrats. The imperial government was thus uh, now in control uh, not only in the Zeches, the Croats and the Italians, but of the Austrian themselves. With the abdication of the uh, of, of the Croats and the Italians, but the Austrians um, by the uh, but the Austrians themselves, with the abdication of Ferdinand in December 1848 because of his mental condition, a new Emperor Francis Joseph, a youth of 18, succeeded you know, and encumbered by any promises about constitutions. The first reviving monarchy could now deal with Hungary. The Hungarians, of whom Kosuth was now virtually the dictator, soon found themselves paying the price of their intolerance to their minorities. All around Hungary, the non Magayans peoples were hostile, and the January 1848-49, it proved a fairly simple matter for Windis Cherak and Jelasik to advance and capture Budapest. Kosuth and the government, however, who fled organized resistance to the Austrians from the provinces, much to the surprise of Europe, this proved very successful. The Hungarians defeating the racial risings of their frontier and compelling the Austrians to withdraw from Budapest. Kosuth had now uh, cut the last of the asunder, ties and asunder, and declared Hungary in March 1849 an independent republic of which he was governor president. The decisive moment had arrived. The Austrian government appealed to a source, uh, to, to, to a source from which they knew they could, in the last resort, derive help, that is Russia. The Tsar Nicholas I, who hated revolutions and republics, was only too willing to aid the young Francis Joseph. Palmerston protested against the intervention, but in vain. By July, an advance of the Russians from the east by the ruthless Austrian general Hianau from the west and Bejelasik from the south made the result a foregone conclusion. The frantic Hungarian governments belated concessions to the minorities, to its minorities, were useless. Kosuth and the Hungarian generals quarreled senselessly, and finally Kosuth abdicated and fled into Turkey, bearing the iron crown of Saint Stephen on the way. The last Hungarian army then lay down arms and surrendered to the Russians. The Russians handed control of the Hianau to Hianau, who found the task of ordering the scores of executions and hundreds of imprisonments so congenial that at last even Vienna grew ashamed and recalled him. Both Kosuth and Hianau incidentally later paid visits to England. Kosuth won a tremendous welcome from the people 
and a reception by, I mean, Palmer Stone in spite of the opposition in the entire cabinet. He now, who had received the nickname of Hyena, was chased by liberal-minded draymen when he visited a London brewery. It remained for Austria to take advantage of, of our escape. In Italy, with the decisive defeat of the Sardinian army at Novara in March 1849, the suppression of the Venetian Republic of, in August, the, I mean the anti-Austrian movement had collapsed. The imperial government resumed control in Lombardy and Venetia and was apparently established there more firmly than ever. Elsewhere, Romans, Kuwaits, Zeches, Hungarians, Poles, all underwent for their varying activities a tightening up control. By the end of 1851, the government felt sufficiently secure in Vienna to abolish the constitution for the empire which it had granted but no impl not implemented. In March 1849, the reaction was everywhere triumph. But though no portion of the empire finally received the great national independence or constitution freedom as a result of the event in 1848-1841, the feudal privileges of the nobility and the serfdom of the peasantry had disappeared, never to return. Just as the first French Revolution, in spite of the latter dictatorship of Napoleon, conferred lasting benefits on the French peasantry, so did the revolution movements in 1848 achieve similar results for the peasantry of the Austrian Empire in spite of the latter establishment of full Habsburg control. <laughs> 